Baseball is back at Shea Stadium. Spring is here, bringing with it a renewed sense of optimism. 2005 is a new year, and these are the new Mets. There are some new faces who've had success in different places, along with young players on the verge of superstardom. Mixed in is the right balance of veterans, and they're led by a local kid named Willie. Opening day is next on MSG. What a glorious day it is in the metropolitan area. The sun is shining, not a cloud in the sky. It's the home opener for the Mets as they take on the Houston Astros. It'll be a matchup of left-handers on the hill. Tom Glavin gets the nod for the Mets. Andy Pettit gets the start for the Astros. Fans filing into Shea Stadium as we expect a sellout crowd this afternoon in Flushing, and we welcome you to the Mets home opener here on MSG. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Lachlan. The first week of the season did not go the way the Mets had hoped but it did end on a bright note. Some late game heroics yesterday afternoon in Atlanta giving the Mets their first victory of the season and so they are buoyed by that come from behind win as they come home to face on the, face the Astros. For more on today's game, let's go upstairs to you, Ted Robinson. All right, Matt, thanks very much. And first of all, the continuation of the longest running opening day tradition at Shea Stadium, the presence once again of Hall of Famer Ralph Kiner. Great to have you here, Ralph. Well, it's great, really great to be here. And of course, it's a great day for baseball. And we go back to 1962 when the Mets first started and they played in the polo grounds. Well, for the Mets, as Matt mentioned uh, yesterday, it was as if one swing, Fran, of Carlos Beltran's bat lifted an immense load off this team and, and propelled them to that first elusive win. Well, it was quiet in Atlanta because of John Smoltz. He was dominating yesterday against the Mets, and then bang! The floodgates opened, and that's the man. Carlos Beltran opened up the floodgates, and then Cliff Floyd went deep. And how about David Wright? So three home runs in the ball game for the New York Mets, and the Mets come home with a victory, and it really a big victory because of this opening day crowd today. Well, and of course for the Mets, Tom Glavin starts opening day, his third Mets assignment, but he'll face a pitcher with a lot of New York familiarity to him, Ralph. Well, they really have uh, a lot of uh, big games in back of him. Andy Pettit is on the mound. He has the best record of any pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball that has pitched in 100 games with wins in New York. He has really been an outstanding pitcher. And the big thing for Andy Pettit, they think he's healthy after elbow surgery that ended his season in August a year ago. Pettit, his second year as an Astro, faces Glavin in his third year as a Met. But yesterday was New Yorker Willie Randolph's first managerial victory. We'll hear from Willie when he joins Matt Lachlan next. It's opening day on MSG. Hey kids, be part of the team by joining the Mets Fan Club for Kids, presented by the Sports Authority. Members receive an ID card, club t-shirt and cap, sports bottle, newsletters, two free tickets, and more. A one-year membership is only $25. Hi kids, I'm David Wright of the New York Mets, and I want you to be part of our team this year. Join the Mets Fan Club for Kids. Here's how. Sign up today. Call 201-784-9600 or visit Mets.com slash Kids Club. At Shea Stadium, it's the home opener between the Mets and the Houston Astros. The Mets come here to Shea Stadium with a new look. They are the new Mets indeed, hoping to put their second consecutive victory together. Well, Willie Randolph is making his home debut, and a short while ago I had a chance to ask the new Mets manager what makes this day special. Everything's special about today. You got to love it, man. You kidding me? Opening day, Shea Stadium, man. You know, family and friends are here. Packed crowd, enthusiastic crowd, I'm sure. So this is this is the ultimate for me, man. I, I feel very fortunate and very blessed to have this opportunity to lead my own team uh, and show everyone what we're about this year. So yeah, I'm going to have a lot of group bumps. I have them right now, and uh, I can't wait to start it. Well, this is special for so many reasons, obviously, and, and you detail them. But I know, I guess your folks are going to be up from South Carolina to witness this, too. Yes, they're here from South Carolina. A lot of friends, a lot of family, a lot of old classmates teammates. I mean, I've got, geez, I'm not going to tell how many tickets I have out, but uh, it's a lot. But you know what? You know, I, I, I'm paying for every one of them, and it's well worth it. 
And if the winning continues here at Shea Stadium for Willie Randolph and the Mets, he'll have a lot more friends by the end of the season. The first pitch is next. Let's go. What a moment of pride this must be for Willie Randolph, born in Brooklyn, a New Yorker all his life, a winner in his baseball life, and the honorary floral presentation of good luck made just moments ago from the granddaughter and grandson of William A. Shea, the man for whom the stadium is named. Bill Shea used to do that every year here at Shea Stadium. Look at Willie Randolph. It's Bill Shea, the man most responsible for the establishment of the New York National League franchise in 1962. Now Tom Glavin on the mound in the lineup he will face for Houston. This is an interesting mix, some old names and some new names. Adam Everett is now the leadoff hitter. Then the familiar names of Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell, the cleanup hitters, third baseman Morgan Ensberg. And then some youth, right fielder Jason Lane in his second year. Rookie left fielder Chris Burke, veteran catcher Brad Ausmus, and a rookie center fielder in Willie Tavares. You see Tom Glavin, those are his Rico numbers from Wednesday's outing against the Cincinnati Reds. So Tom Glavin on the mound looking for his first victory of the season for the Mets. And he'll rely on his defense in a strong fashion. We'll give you the defense right after this. So ready to go as Adam Everett takes ball one. This is a change Phil Garner has had a lot of change in Houston this year. This is one of them. It elevated Everett to the leadoff spot, which had been manned by Craig Biggio forever in Houston. Everett has been a big prospect for the Astros for a few years. Now they would like to see him realize that potential. He was the shortstop on the gold medal Olympic team as Biggio waits. Where Doug Minkiewicz of the Mets was the first baseman. 2-1 now, 2. Everton, of course, early on will watch the strike zone, which bit Tom Glavin in his first start in Cincinnati. And we've talked about this, Ralph, how when hitters go to the plate now, they look away from Tom Glavin all the time. Well, he's made a great living in a way, and that ball was out over the plate. That's going to be a foul ball, and will wind up in the seats. Let's take a look at that defense behind Tom Glavin. You can see down there at first base, you got Minkiewicz, Matsui Reyes in right in the infield, then Cliff Floyd, Carlos Beltran, and Victor Diaz left to right in the outfield. Diazza behind the plate. Glavin on the mound. There's Cliff Floyd looking up, checking out that sun. It's a tough sun field, but two outfield assists on Saturday. Never seen anything like it. He threw two ground balls and got two guys at the plate. Backhanded by Reyes. Guns it low, and Minkiewicz with the beautiful pick. Pick it, Wilson. Well, they're good both playing on both sides. A good backhand pickup by Reyes, and then the throw in the dirt. The splits by McKevitz, and a good out. How about the ground giving out on Jose Reyes? He was looking at it after he got up. Ground gave out. He was still able to set himself, bounce the ball, and Kavich picked it to first base. Well, here is the ageless Biggio. 39 now is Craig Biggio. And he has moved yet again. Center field last year for the half, first half, left field for the second half of last year. Now he's back at second base. Ralph, it's unbelievable. He went from the, the biggest transition for me was when he went from catching to second base and became a gold glover. And was a all star player at both positions. And then going to center field, played a little left field, now mm -hmm. back at second look base. At, look at those numbers right there. Now, would he still be playing if he was behind the plate? I mean, he's a strong kid, good bat, but that catching wears you out. Now, the other thing is, will moving around keep him out of the Hall of Fame? He's got some Hall of Fame numbers. He's got some great numbers, no question. And, of course, he's played together with Bagwell a period of um, 15 years. Bagwell, two of them together. Bagwell certainly has a shot at it. He has a good shot at it. Yep. Here's Bagwell waiting. Biggio's got 2,649 hits. Is a ball, so Biggio walks on four. The one time Biggio was a big running threat. Well, fans, remember that Hyundai and MSG Networks are teaming up to strike out pediatric cancer, donating $50 for every recorded strikeout by a Mets pitcher to the Hope and Heroes Children's Cancer Fund. Tom Glavin looked a little unsettled that the 3 0 pitch was called a ball by 
Home plate umpire Mark Wagner. Looked a little bit low. It was close. Very close. Bagwell, of course, with the an outstanding career. And one time a member of the Red Sox was traded to Houston, was a third baseman. They made him a first baseman. He said 448 career home runs. The amazing thing about this guy in the minor leagues, I believe his best production in the home run department was four. Became a home run hitter in the big leagues, Ralph, starting in the dome in Houston. He's got that peculiar way of hitting. He moves the front foot back. No one's ever done that. You got that right, huh? No one has ever done that in hit. It's incredible. You know how strong you got to be to move your front foot backwards? That's your stride. Do they still call it a stride? Do they call it a backup stride? I think, well, with them, it'd be a backup slide. That's the back. Watch the front foot. The front foot is a main foot. Yeah. And the one thing about that, and again, another borderline yes, yeah. pitch. That's. That's another one Glavin wants. Well, as you mentioned, Ted, it's all about the uh, strike zone. Will Tom Glavin get yeah, some was... charity in and out of the strike zone? Well, they made a living off the plate for a long, long time, and then they changed the strike zone. Well, that was over the plate, but had to be judged low. That's very low. Now it's three and one. And right here in a three-one count, some managers will put the runner in motion here. I don't believe in that. I think the hitter, when you're as good as Bagwell, should be given the luxury of picking the pitch. Ralph, if you're a home run hitter, do you get up on top of the plate and try to pull Glavin hard to left field? No question about it. And Biggio does not run. Bagwell fouls it. That's my approach to hitting. Not many batters will. I was right on top of the plate and pulled the ball all the time, and uh, Bagwell basically not. A batter that will be close to the plate at all. Look how far away from the plate he is. He has to go to right field in the outside pitch. Biggio will run here, and he'll stay out of a double play. Reyes runs down Bagwell for the second out. Biggio into scoring position. Well, one thing that Tom Glavin, I mean, he's a smart pitcher. He wants to take advantage of his defense. If he can get the opposition to hit the ground ball to this, especially the left side of this infield, he's got a real good chance of winning a lot of ball games. He did it with the Braves. Although he has struck out over 2,000 batters, he has relied on his defense throughout his career. He is really a contact pitcher. That's a type of pitcher who wants the ball to hit on the ground. So the cleanup hitter for Houston, at least to start the year, is their third baseman, Morgan Ensberg, trying to bring Biggio in with two out. Of course, the Astros had Jeff Kent in their lineup last year. He's gone to the Dodgers. Another guy with Hall of Fame numbers, Jeff Kent. Well, right now, Ensberg is filling the gap until Lance Berkman returns, which may be by the end of this month, early part of May. Berkman. Wanted to be sure he was introduced today. I tell you what, the, <laughs> the, the Astros are a different club without him. He's a potent offensive threat. But you think about the Houston team that played, that won the wild card, went right down to game seven of the LCS last year, and they're missing Kent, they're missing Berkman right now, and they're missing Beltra. Yeah. That's a lot of offense. Phil Gardner, when he took over the ball club on July 14th last year, had a record of 48 and 26. Right field, that's hit well. That's over Diaz's head, and that ball is off the wall. And it will be a double for Ensberg and a run batted in. Well, we mentioned how when the opposition goes up against Tom Glavin, they are thinking the other way. They are not thinking about trying to pull that ball. A guy like Ensberg almost right popped his ball over the wall. Tom has that tail on his fastball right there, Ralph. Ensberg goes with it, just misses a home run. And the wind blowing out toward right field. Taking the ball over the head of Diaz and the Houston takes the lead by a one nothing score. That ball really out on the outside and hit well. Second RBI. That's all it is for Ensberg in six games is the cleanup hitter. Now Jason Lane will get a chance to play full time this year as Andy Pettit will know. He has at least uh, one run to go to the mound with. 
and that'll be it. Glavin snags Lane's ball. Inning over. But the walk to Biggio winds up as a run for Houston. The top of the first of the home opener at Shea. Andy Pettit will face the Mets in the home opener at Shea. The Mets will have Reyes, Matsui, and Beltran as always the top. Then Piazza, Floyd, and Wright. Minkiewicz, Diaz, and Glavin right now. This is the, the top lineup for the Mets against the left-hand pitcher. Andy Pettit has been a winner, especially in postseason play, but during the season, he's always been consistent. He's had a bad arm last year, but he's a terrific pitcher with a great move to first base, so he might be able to shut down the Mets' speed. And he starts with a strike to Reyes. Now, the big thing to watch early is going to be the upper left corner of the screen. Pettit, who has always been able to throw in the you know, break 90, the low 90s after his elbow surgery last year, does not have that velocity back. And in his first game against St. Louis, he said it was pretty routinely 84, 85, but was able to move the ball. That was 84 right there. And, that, and you know, it's a, when you throw that high fastball, that's when you usually get your good velocity. Third ball, golf to the left field corner, and it's going to go foul. Oh, defensively for the Strohs. There it is right there. Bagwell, who's a real good defensive first baseman. And you get Biggio, Everett, and Innsberg in the infield. Burke, Tavares, and Lane left to right in the outfield. Awesome, it's good throwing catcher behind the plate. Hey, Craig Biggio, look at those numbers. Over 1,500 career starts at second base, and he's been terrific. Seton Hall product. They should be proud of him in that baseball program at Seton Hall. One and two now to Reyes. Pass ball away. Infield now dropping back with a two strike count. No threat to bunt here. Got the shallow right coming on and mm. making the catch is Lane. So Reyes retired. The second baseman. Number 25. And there's our Hyundai keys to the game. Continue with the big flies. The Mets need those long fly balls for home runs. And Andy Pettit against the Mets running game. We mentioned that. That's our Hyundai keys to the game. Pettit with a terrific move to first base. And he has a good throwing catch behind the plate. That's just as important. Now to Matsui. Strike of the knees. Has his numbers off the road trip, including his opening day home run last Monday. This is the fourth time that Pettit and Glavin faced each other. One of them was game three of the World Series in 1999. Both pitchers got a no decision in that one. Chad Curtis homer in the 10th inning to win that game for the Yankees. Beltran on deck. He'll follow Matsui. He got quite an ovation when introduced here prior to the game. How about the one Pedro Martinez got? That was number one. That was number one. Ooh, sharp breaking ball. So that gets Matsui. Well, the uh, strikeouts rounding up for Matsui. And of course, there has to be a little bit of emotion on the Houston side watching sure. this, knowing how hard they tried to re sign him. They put a lot of their winter plans on hold as the owner, Drake McLean right to the wire trying to keep Beltran. So Phil Gardner, he must have a empty spot in his stomach when he looks at Beltran in another uniform because for Phil Gardner, Beltran meant winning. And they almost won and got in the World Series. They have never been in a World Series game. Houston started at the same time as the Mets in 1962. Actually, Houston had a farm club in 1961. Yeah, Mike Scott almost led them to a World Series, but those guys with the 86 Mets, an exciting ball club. They beat him. What a playoffs that was. Whoa.
Well, how about the sixth game of that series? Unreal. Mets were behind three to one to end the game in the ninth inning. Made it three three, and then won it in the fifteenth. Best yeah. game you ever saw, Ralph? Had to be one of the great games of all time. Yes. Inside target here, and that's whacked into left field. The pennant got that one up to 88, but still a little bit. And that cutter still a little bit short of where he would normally be. Phil Garner says, "Why not us?" Beltran picking up a base hit. Fans, they're going to be. This is going to be a love affair between Beltran and these fans here in New York. Look at him now. He does hit this ball real hard. A Panasonic Ideas for Life, a digital replay. Ralph, he kind of muscled that ball. To he left did field. muscle it back out to left field. Don't forget, he hit eight playoff home runs, oh. the tie a major league record held by Barry Bonds. What a series he had just last year. Mike Piazza takes a strike. Mike three out of 16 on the season opening trip. Played with, four of the six games. With Piazza hitting in that, of course, he's one of the great hitters. Beltre won't be running as much as he has in the past. And here's where Grant's point also comes in. Pettit has just always been extraordinary in keeping runners with a move that he says he taught himself. No one taught him. He said he's had it since he was a high school. In my opinion, every pitcher should have at least a decent move to first base as you look at Piazza's numbers because all you have to do for that is to work at it. Or, or, or block. That was the one reason. <laughs> That's when you have a good move That's when you block the first base. And I mean, not called by the umpires. Most left handers block the first base every time. Here's that last pitch of Mike Piazza. He threw it right by him. Well, here we go again. Fastball. Mike had a good swing. Just sometimes you just have to say to the pitcher, I missed it. Get that ball up. Mm hmm. Very short lead for Beltran. With Floyd next. Mets have been a behind most of the first six plus games they played. And it's been a lot of first inning runs as it was here today. Low. Well, Pettit has an interesting record. He's been in the major leagues 10 years, and he has been a winning pitcher of every one of those 10 years. That ties a record held by someone you'd never believe holds a record. The record is held by Babe Ruth along <laughs> with Pettit. Babe Ruth, a great pitcher before he became one of the great home runners in the history of the game. Beltran will be in motion. Here's that move, and it's close. I mean, he he, he steps. It, it's, it, let's take a look at this one. Look at the front foot. You got to step to first base, a diagonal line. That's a rule, but and it's close. It never does work. The umpires today call the block on left-handed pitchers usually when they move that front foot behind the pivot foot, which is on the rubber, and then they throw to first base. Once they do that, they got to go home. Payotts in a left center field, but up in the air. And uh, a lot of air Ooh. out there. Oh, and a collision between Tavares and Burke. Two rookies. You could see it coming. And Tavares caught the ball. They were fighting the sun. <laughs> Willie Randolph. A ton of, as he mentioned, a Matt in a pregame, a ton of family and friends here. A very nice video tribute. To John Franco just played here on the new board at Shea Stadium. Yeah, that, that, that's a nice tribute, and Vito Vitiello and the boys in the production crew here at Shea did a nice job putting that together. Jim Gunkel. Chris Burke, the batter, takes a strike. John Franco. I was very glad to hear he got a very warm ovation yeah. when he was introduced today. A lot of memories for John here. And I'm sure he could reach over and he probably want to reach over and give great Looper a little hug when Looper received his reception, which was uh, obviously completely 
caused by last Monday. John understands it well. Ball to Burke, two and that's one. A, that's probably the only job in baseball. If you're not perfect, yep. you get tattooed. Right. Demands perfection. The demands perfection. You can have that closer job. Hit that off the end of the bat. And Wright throws it away. Stayed in the place that Burke will be safe at first. He never really got set to make this throw as the ball bounces back on him. And it's in the dirt, no chance. Shouldn't say it's in the dirt, but it becomes in the dirt on the bad throw. I guess that right there, David Wright had a rush. He wanted to rush yep. that throw because he respected Burke's speed. The ball was not hit fast, and Burke is fast. Burke was a big base stealer in minor leagues. That, you know, I, I can relate to that as a catcher. You, you do things, there, he's got it. And it came it throw is Aaron and Burke is at second base. Not two bad throws and the Mets don't have that out there looking for. Well, Doug McCavage is a gold glover and he does the right thing comes up and greets the ball and then he throw, when you throw the ball aside on him occasionally you won't get that real good carry on it. Look at that. Good play by Rios to stop that ball from going into but the outfield. But again, the speed is the thing that makes guys rush. You saw David Wright rush, you saw Doug McCavich rush, and you saw Chris Burke, who's been rushing the first and now the second. But that, that good speed will make you rush your throws. They have not announced the scoring on either play. I believe that the runner is going to have to give it a stolen base there because he was running. Yeah, there'd be an error in David Wright's throw. But David sure. Wright, that ball, I believe, should be scored. Yeah, there. yeah. So runner at second, nobody out. And the Mets having what they hope will be a rare lapse in the infield. Center field, Beltron back. And today begins an education for Carlos Beltron that Mike Cameron can talk to him about. That's learning to play this center field, Ralph. Well, there's a lot of wind there at Chase Stadium. If you've been here, you can see it. And one thing about Asmus, he is now one for 32 against Tom Glavin. Carlos Beltran chasing that ball down. Willie Mays told me there was, I, I asked him one time how tough it was to play center field here at, at Chase Stadium. He didn't find it that difficult, he said. Well, he didn't find anything. No, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't. He <laughs> didn't. That's right. That's right. Ralph. I know I heard people say that he felt the, the, that the center field at Shea was tough, but when I asked him about it last year, he said, nah. One thing about this park, though, the wind does blow. And of course, the Jets played football here. And the wind is hard to predict. And the one thing that the Jets did, they put flags on the uh, goalposts to see which way the wind was blowing. And Turner, their field goal kicker, would watch those flags and then judge where he had to put that football on play. Ooh, Jim Turner, wow. It's going back. Willie Tavares, the batter, with Pettit on deck. So this is a the out that Glavin really wants. And of course, Tavares wants to hit the ball no, no place else to the right side, move the runner along, although there's one out. Andy Pettit to follow. Tavares was not supposed to be here this year. He's a 23-year-old rookie from double-A ball. But he had a terrific spring. He should go give Carlos Beltran a hug. This kid, from the words uh, in the Houston clubhouse before the game, absolutely can fly. They they can envision him as a Juan Pierre type of player. Well, they got some real good speed on this ball club now. Jeff Kent is gone. Carlos Beltran is gone. But they've added some real good speed. Tavares scored Saturday night standing up from first base on a double to win the game for Houston against Cincinnati and they haven't seen that in a long time. Well if he hits he'll be a terrific player because of his speed. Of course if you hit you don't need speed. He'll still be a terrific player. He can't steal first base. That's it. Yeah. Got him there. That's location there that Tom hit in Cincinnati didn't get the call Wednesday night and well, he got it here. When you tell young players, look at don't look for anything inside. This can happen to a young player. 
They're conditioned by the older players, by the hitting instructor, to look away from for Tom Clavin, look away, look away, look away, and then you lock them up inside. That ball looked like 150 miles an hour to Tavares. And again, there was a great shot, two great shots, really, watching Piazza never moving. And Clavin hit his glove and got rewarded. Another Mohegan Sun League leaders from Mohegan Sun, a world of play. Show you where Pettit and Glavin rank among active lefties as the best, two of the four top winning percentages. And of course, for Pettit, I would have to think early in the year that hitting is not going to be a high priority for him since he injured his elbow last year. The elbow injury that eventually had to have surgery. He injured it on a check swing in his first start last season as an Astro. Check swing. Hmm. He works out quite a bit during the offseason. He and Roger Clemens work out very, very hard. Pettit was joking during the BP today. He said, This is not a weapon in my hand. <laughs> can understand he only made 15 starts last season. The last start Pettit made was here in early August. On the ground to Reyes. And uh, the misplay at the start of the inning does not hurt. Glavin able to pitch through it. Bottom of the second. And Shea 1 0 Houston. Well, there's a the score Astros 1, Mets zip. And a reminder, Mets fans, do you know how easy it is to dress like your favorite player? Just go to Mets.com and click on shop for everything from player jerseys to T-shirts and caps. Visit the Mets.com shop for all of your Mets merchandise. Cliff Floyd will start at the bottom of the second in the home opener at Shea on a bright, sunny day. Just to, we lost a few degrees from yesterday which was a spectacular spring day in New York. A little bit more wind, but still a very nice opening day. Well, one thing for certain, first week, Cliff Floyd's had some success against left-handers. Right, two homers mm -hmm. off left-handed relievers, which is one more than he hit all of last year. He's been hot and cold against left-handers on a yearly basis. Maybe this is the year he clobbers left-handers. You know, Ralph, we were talking uh, last week about that great saying in baseball some of the trades some of your best trades are the ones you don't make this could prove to be true with Cliff Floyd if he can deliver in a big fashion this year offensively. He certainly uh, needs to have a good year for the Mets. He's off to a good enough start 304. They play Floyd not to pull, spread it away in the outfield. Had it pulled the string there, 2 2. Here's that last pitch of Cliff Floyd. The home runs he hit were off fastballs. He gets out in front. I said this before. I told the story that he told me that he learned how to hit left handers by watching Craig Consul get hit in the head. He said he decided to keep that front shoulder in so he could turn away from the ball, made him a better hit against left handers. Pettit, good. Play. Well, there's a benefit of squaring up as you finish. Which Pettit does, he can field his position. That's a base hit if he doesn't touch it. You gotta be crazy not to be able to square up today because these kids hit the ball too hard back well, through that box. Did you watch the highlights last night? Pavano. Oh my gosh, Derek Lowe. Yeah. Smoked also Pavano in the head, which was remarkable that he actually was okay. The guy that had the perfect fundamentals, Ralph, you watch him for a lot of years here. He was ready at all times, Tom Seaver. Yeah, great uh Set up position for a ball hit back through the middle. Kuz was the same way, wasn't he? Kuzman also the same way. They both uh, touched the ground with their back knee when they threw the ball to the plate. They really got down low. David Wright. 250 on the opening road trip. Takes the ball, it's 1-1. He's just getting ready. He's getting loose. A couple home runs. Very strong right-handed hitter as you look at Mike Piazza in the dugout along with Tom Glavin. Oh boy, he got jammed. Yeah, he did. Got that in. Gets a little roller to Bagwell, two down. All right, now the home run in yesterday's game and the Mets 
Struck out 18 times in that game. So Panasonic still digital won. replay. 18 strikeouts, you win the game. Does that bring back a memory, Ralph? Sure does. Back in 1969, Ron Svoboda against Steve Carlton, who struck out 19 in that game, hit two home runs, and the Mets won it 4-1. to one. Part of that great year of 1969. And he did that in St. Louis. There's a ball to Minkiewicz. Minkiewicz has pretty good record against Pettit, 5 out of 13 with a home run from their American League days. Had a pitch. It's got that breaking ball, Ralph. Good curveball right there, and he's he's really a good pitcher because he pitches what a lot of pitchers would say is backwards. When he's behind in the count, he throws breaking balls. But you, you mentioned this too. I mean, there's the difference in technical pitching between Pettit and Glavin. The Pettit's got that breaking ball. He can use the left-hand hitters. And Glenn has no curveball at all. Never throws a curveball. He used to throw a curveball on a slider. He said he stopped because he has better control with his fastball. He felt it would be more productive for him to throw a pitch that he could control all the time rather than to throw some breaking balls that he couldn't control. That is rather an unusual process. He's, he's very unusual to be able to live off his fastball throughout his career. There's another pitcher in this ballpark who pitched the same way. Never threw a curveball. His name? John Franco. Yeah. And Kavich goes down for that, drives it to center field for the second Met hit. Kavich has swung the bat nicely the first week of the year, and he swung it, I, I think, too true to his track record. A little bit of power, not a lot. Good swing on a left hand. Hung in there on a left hand, huh, Ralph? Kept that yeah. head in there. Good down. Went down, got that pitch, slapped it into center field. So that'll get Victor Diaz to the plate. Victor is showing some power. He's got a good swing, that's a ball hard. He started with the Dodgers from Chicago, Illinois. Well, we talked about Andy Pettit's move to first base. He's got a, 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 an excellent move. It just causes a problem for your speedsters when you know he can pick you off. The ball fisted out the left center field. That's going to fall for a hit. And Kavich on his way to third. So the Mets put together back to back two out hits. As Victor Diaz is quickly becoming a fan favorite. They he, they started to like him last year. They're falling in love with this kid. There was a lot of talk about him during the offseason, Ralph, whether or not he would make the ball club. And a good uh, year in the minor leagues. He's a hitter. He's a bat looking for a position. You know what, though? He's got a, a good, strong throwing arm. And I got a feeling that if, if he works hard enough, he'll be more than adequate as a as a glove man in right field. Come on, Ralph, you are an outfielder. It's an easy job. You can throw, it's good. He's got a good arm. Mm -hmm. I should, I'm really being facetious about anything being mm -hmm. easy. So now Tom Glavin has a chance to really help himself. Inside out the swing, on hopper to Everett. And so, Glavin unable to deliver that two out hit. That's lead two, we'll go to the third. That's shit. There's one very special group here in Shea today. How big is this group, Matt Lachlan? Uh, it's almost uh, incalculable. I mean, a sea of Randolph supporters here behind home plate. Willie's wife is here, along with uh, his brothers and his parents who have made the trip from South Carolina. I'm joined by Minnie Randolph and uh, Willie Sr. And first off, Mrs. Randolph, can you just describe what the feeling is like as you see your son manage a team he grew up cheering for? I'm feeling, I'm just so happy. 
and I'm proud of him because he's a hard work, always been a hard working person. And I'm just happy that, you know, you work hard and you accomplish. Well, of course, he has worked awfully hard in this game. Mr. Randolph, did you did you think this day would come? He's been through so many disappointments in trying to get that first job. Uh, I, yes, I think it would would come one one of these days because, uh, you know, Willie don't give up on things. You know, he he likes to, you know, keep on fighting for it. And I think that he would have got a, a manager job if he wasn't here. I didn't have no idea to get it here, but it would have been someplace else. It only seems right that it would be here because not only did he grow up a Mets fan, but you told me just a moment ago, Mr. Randolph, that you helped build this Shea Stadium. <coughs> Willie? You know, you did. You helped construct Shea Stadium. You were involved in the building of this uh, facility. Yeah, well, um, I worked here some. You know, we didn't, not the whole job building it, but, you know, off and on, I, uh, the company that I worked with, they had parts of it, you know, so, yeah, that's back in this early part of the 60s I think it was absolutely 1964 was opening day here so you knew he was going to get the job you weren't sure it was necessarily here when it finally was announced that he was going to get the job here what was your reaction Mrs. Randolph I thought it was really amazing to grow up in New York play for two famous teams and then be able to manage the teams. I knew he would manage the Yankees or the Mets. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be a New York team one way or the other. New York, yes. I'm just so happy. You know, I, I've seen that dreams do come true. And um, as I say, it's a blessing. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, I feel like a millionaire myself sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a beautiful day, I think we all do, fellas, but there are fans here who have a little extra involved in the game emotionally. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Randolph, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Fellas, back upstairs to you. Boy, proud parents. And yesterday, when the Mets recorded the final out in Atlanta, the great scene was all of the people in the dugout congregating around Willie. Yeah. To congratulate him as Glavin hits the inside corner back to back pitches to Biggio. And once again, this is the result of thinking away. You're talking about a real good major league hitter in Craig Biggio, Ralph. No doubt about that. But Mrs. Randolph forgot one thing. He played for three great teams. Pittsburgh was also there. Yes, when he first came up. Went from Pittsburgh to the Yankees. Yeah, that was disappointing for a lot of people because Doc Medich was traded for him, and we had Doc's pitches in the American League. Then he ended up in the National League. <laughs> so you were really a Oh, we were unhappy. I told Willie that. Willie also played for Oakland, for Tony La Russa on uh, a championship team near the end of Willie's career. Bagwell grounded a short his first time. The first player to get to Randolph in the dugout yesterday was Tom Glavin. And I asked Tom this morning, so what did you say to Willie? And he said, I told him it's about time. <laughs> and I think you can fill in the blank. <laughs> and the match started off 0 for 5. That's a hard way to start, but they've done that before. In 1962, they lost their first nine games. In 63, they lost their first eight games. In 64, they lost for their first seven games. 65, their first six games. And then they got rained out three straight days <laughs> in Cincinnati, and that was their best start. <laughs> Bagwell reaches out, right field. Diaz plays that nicely. And a good inning for Glavitt. A couple of strikeouts, then Bagwell on a fly out. Top of the order to face Andy Pettit in the last of the third inning. Reyes shows bunt, takes the slow curve for a strike. Jose's been a hitter. He's got 11 hits, now 29 at bats. He's at to reach base via a walk. Ralph, that wouldn't bother me if he could hit himself 300, 320, steal a bunch of bases, hit some home. He's going to hit some home runs. Before he's done, he'll hit over 20, maybe 25 home runs. So one man. season? Yes. Okay, we'll write you down for that. Ball jumps off his bat. Not there, but it jumps off his bat. I'll tell you the one thing he can do. You saw right there. He can hit 
down in the count. Like he can hit an and, and the ball explodes off his bat. All right, it's the Amtrak Acela Express home run inning. To enter a set of postcard to the address you see on your screen, if you're chosen, and a Met homers in the third inning here at Shea, you'll win tickets to an upcoming game. And if the home run goes over that side on the right field fence, you'll win two tickets to an Amtrak Acela Express destination. You mark it down, Ralph. Before he's done playing in one year, he's going to hit 20 to 25 home runs. I've already marked it down. All right. You're liable. <laughs> <laughs> now Matsui. <laughs> He takes the strikes. Pettit working ahead of the count. And he, uh, he's that type of uh, pitcher. He can get the ball where he wants it. Right now, the Mets are trailing by a score of 1 0, and they have four hits to one. They can, and they can use their speed right here. They don't necessarily have to steal the base, but they can use their speed. A wild swing right there. And That's going to be a problem. The one thing about Kaz is that he does not. Put the ball in play enough. He's a free swinger in the second hole. Well, now that's a, tough. That's no good. Yeah. And he last year in a, a, over 400 at bats, he struck down 94 times. So in order to be a productive second hitter, he's going to have to put the ball in play. Got more. to make contact. Interesting. There's now Pettit used the high leg kick on that pitch. Again. Well, the secret. Yeah. And Matsui rolls one wide at third, one but not two, and the throw is back in play. Did not get into the Met dugout, so Matsui will be safe at first. And one thing about Matsui, he made a move towards second base. So he had to get back to the bag before being tagged. Did you with the wild throw? Yeah, he had a high, a high uh, release point there, throwing that ball away, trying to get it over the. Well, didn't, no problem from the runner, just threw the ball over Bagwell's head. Here's Matsui putting that ball in play. Matsui with good speed, it's tough to double him up. Ted, you were talking about Pettit kicking that leg high. As far as left-handers are concerned, if they have a decent move, they're better off kicking their leg high. Yeah. As you can see, but he's, he's able to do that and get away with it because the runners don't move. read it, right? It's funny, yeah. It, you know, every now and then you can throw in a slide step just to keep them honest, but he's got such a good move to first base. The secret is a lot of body movement, and that high leg kick is important for a left-hander. Kuzman was like that, wasn't he, Ralph? Yes, he was. Kick the leg high, but... Throws the runner. And then the other pitcher in the game, who and I think statistically there have been fewer bases stolen against him than anybody, is Terry Mulholland. Oh, but Mulholland is just quick. He's a quick slide stone. He doesn't bring the leg up high. Now, Terry had an unusual move to first base. He threw the glove to first base with the ball, didn't it? <laughs> here, wasn't it? Yeah, right oh, here in this ball car. Oh, hit that ball? Hernandez. Keith Hernandez. And the first baseman was the manager of the Arizona Diamondbacks. Right, Brent, Bob Brentley. And Bob said he, he practiced that play all the time. 1-1 <laughs> one, one here to Beltran, who singled the left his first time. Mm. You know, it's funny, Pettit pretty much jammed him last time up, and Beltran was able to hit the ball to left field right here. He rushes that bat through the hitting zone. He didn't want to get jammed again. He fouls the ball off his leg. But Pettit's obviously busting him in. So the Astros, after playing with Carlos Beltran, feel at least from the right side of the plate, you got to bust him in if you're a left-handed pitcher. Center fielder off the shadow on center. And Tavares shading a little bit to left center. And a swing and a miss. Beltran is out on strikes. Two for Pettit. The ball out of the strike zone. Um, a swinging strikeout. He went up high and then down low on him. He got him. He fouled the ball off his leg up high, and then he got him to chase a bad ball downstairs. So Piazza hits with two outs at Matsui at first. That's a uh, stolen baseman in Japan, but he has not really ever shown the intention of stealing the bases. He's really been laid back here in the States. Now there's another Japanese middle infielder breaking in the big leagues this year, Tadahito Iguchi with the Chicago White Sox. 
he's gotten off to a nice start his first week. How about Ichiro? If he doesn't get at least two hits a game, he goes one for four, it's a bad day. His average drops a lot, then. Oh. Set the all-time record for base hits in the single season. Didn't start off this year with multiple hits in every game. Here's that last pitch. Pulls the string, gets Mike Piazza way out in front. Bennett is really knows how to pitch. Pulling the string also with the fastball, not overpowering right now. Well, well done, the block by Osmus. Osmus is a real good defensive catcher. Watch this. Watch him use that chest protector. You let, you, they call it smothering the ball. You kind of round your shoulders to let the ball hit your chest protector, and it, you hope it dies in front of you. He's a real good defensive player. Two things you think about. You, you hope the ball dies in front of you, and you hope you don't die. <laughs> well, there's certain areas of the body you don't want to get hit. That's why you want to use that chest protector. Mike's a little over anxious right there, chasing a bad ball. Take a look at this, Ralph. You don't see that very often on Piazza's part. It was almost like he was guessing fastball. Well, there's no question about the fact he looks for certain pitches, and right there, he had to be looking fastball. Yeah. And you can just see now the last three hitters have all swung at pitches that are balls. So Pets obviously got something great movement, something working. with 155 wins and 82 losses. Six and two lifetime against the Mets. And the fastball, that's the fastest pitch he's thrown today. He got that to 89. And he set him up for that with off-speed pitches yes. down low. We're buying. Fourth inning of the home opener at Shea. Mets and the Astros have an off day tomorrow. Then Wednesday night, these teams will go back at it with Roger Clemens pitching for Houston. Clemens is not here today. Has that in his deal with the Astros. As Ensberg swings and misses, he does not have to be here. If he's not pitching, he will arrive in New York tomorrow. Years ago with the Giants, uh, Herman Franks was the manager. He would allow certain pitchers or sometimes even an everyday player to go home and then show up like a day later. And usually it was the pitcher. And of course, you had to have pretty good credentials like Gaylord Perry. Hall of Famer right there. And of course, uh, pitchers don't do a thing the day before they pitch. They really don't even run. Sometimes uh, it's nice to, to to show up and just lend some support. Now I know that it's different today because you have clauses in your contract, and if you're of a great value, you're able to get that. Amazing what the um, well, how the contracts have changed over the years. Oh. At one time, every contract was the same. Every player had the same conditions. Nowadays, they're all individual. Ripped into left field. Ensberg has his second hit. Both hits off of Glavin. Drove in the, the only run in the first inning with a double. And that was the right field. All right, there's a wrap like question today. Which pitcher has pitched in the most games for the Mets? You think he's in the uh, ballpark? I think he's in the ballpark. Yeah, I do too. And it, it, oh, I mean, that'd be a starting pitch. I was going to say, you think Seaver's still here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the interruption in, in his career with the Mets. Runner going. Big jump. Piazza, though, got him. And a great throw by Piazza. Well, the Astros are going to try and run on Mike Piazza. If he throws out a field like he does here, he can stop it. You know what's good about that? A little, very little body movement. He caught it, and his front foot, he, his stride was the second base, and he made a strong throw. Boy, that was 
That's as fine a throw as you've seen Mike make in a, quite a while. It was a one-step throw. One yeah. step. No crow hop, no moving out of the box. And the right guns down, Jason. Lane two away. If, if Mike could use that type of a approach, throwing the ball every time, and, of course, his confidence picks up and reaches second base in the air, he'll throw out. Watch, watch the velocity on this ball. He had good, strong throw. Now look at strides to second, no loss motion. See, he has a strong arm. Basically, what it boils down to is he's lost his confidence. But right there, that can help him regain his confidence. That one step throw was a main thing for him because he's not really fast moving when he does right. a crow hop. The, exactly. thing, the thing about Mike is, is he has terrific discipline at the plate. From the waist up, he's an excellent hitter. He's quick as can be. From the waist down, he's slow with his feet, the movement of his feet. But if he could throw the ball with very little body motion like he did that last time, he'll be fine. Because if you notice the throw, good velocity. He's a good, he has a, a strong arm. You watch him in infield practice, and you don't worry about the strength of his arm. So Glavin ahead now of the rookie Chris Burke, 0-2. Just missing away. I know there's been a lot of work with Mike about his footwork, you know, coming out of the shoot. I, I, I don't think he necessarily has to worry about that as much as if they could show him that throw he just made and say, give us about 100 of those with your, with your footwork, he'll be fine. You know, Charlie Fox, a GM and a manager in the major league, said he wouldn't sign a player unless he could watch him dance. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't play for Charlie. <laughs> Well, Glavin with a strikeout. He has four and has pitched well. Now the Mets back to work trying to break through. Houston leading on the strength of a first inning run. With Floyd, then David Wright, Doug Minkiewicz. Floyd in that last pitch, Fran. Turned away from uh, the pitch back toward the catcher, and, and that's that, what you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's what he said helped him hit left-handers. Greg Consul was his teammate in Florida. He was Cliff was on the end deck circle. Greg Consul could hit in the head. He said, "I don't want that to happen to me." So instead of opening up against left-handers, he closes, and if the ball's inside, he turns towards the catcher, which helps you keep your front side in. That was the first thing I learned in high school from my high school coach. How to get away from inside pitchers, and they have to turn back toward the umpire and catcher to get down and under. Chase that high ball, Biggio out into right field, makes the play. Well, one of the things that Met fans have uh, focused on over the past few years is Mike Piazza's throwing. Now, on the left side of your screen, watch Mike catch a ball in this game with very little body motion. He takes it, gets that ball up and throw. Now, on the other side, the right side's Brad Osmus. Brad with more footwork. Brad is smaller in stature than Mike Biaccio. You gotta take that into consideration. Also, Brad's feet are quicker behind the plate. At the dish, at the plate, when you're hitting, Mike's feet are, it's amazing to me as a hitter, Mike, it's almost a computerized strike, never over strides. But that was a great shot of him throwing the ball to second base. And if he could catch it and throw the ball every time like that, he'll throw a lot of runners out because you saw the strength of his arm. He still has good arm strength. And if one guy can overcome it, you know, it, it, as a former catcher, it makes you kind of flinch because he's had trouble. He's been bouncing the ball. But I feel with his history, if anybody can over overcome that throwing problem, it's Mike Piazza. He's worked hard to become a catcher. Well, that has been his only knock as a catcher. Of course, he's a hit better than any catcher in the history of baseball. He's in baseball, it's hitting for power. Yeah, he's going to go down as one of the great right -hand hitting hitters in the game. Ooh. David Wright to the left field corner, and the Mets should have their first extra base hit. And it will be a one-out double for David Wright. Well, David Wright, Ralph, that ball explodes off his back. I hit this ball well. We're going to answer the Aflac trivia question. Is he indeed wearing a Houston uniform today? Yes, he is. Over a thousand games in his career, second most ever, nearly 700 of them as a Met. And John Franco back, was received warmly, a very nice ovation from the 
sellout Shea Stadium crowd. Nice video tribute to John Franco between innings a couple innings ago. And the most games ever pitched by a left hand pitcher by another left hander and another Met Jesse Orozco. So Minkiewicz will have a chance. Don't know about Diaz. Astros if they can get Minkiewicz out would have a decision to make. But Diaz first base open pitcher behind him. And that will be the decision here. As Minkiewicz makes the second out David Wright goes to third. The Mets just in the first seven games now have just not hit the way they want with runners in scoring position. They've been scoring a lot of runs with the long ball, but they've not yet delivered those big hits to manufacture runs. We are talking about David Wright is on third base. Now that ball, his first time up, he got jammed, and then he just hit a double, and a ball just explodes off his bat. Got a little bit of an upper uppercut swing, but very strong hands. Nothing wrong with an uppercut mm -hmm. swing. That's how you hit home runs. Well, Mike Piazza, when he hits the ball, he when he hits the ball just right, he has a lift to his swing. So we'll see how the Astros approach Diaz here with right at third and two out. Boy, they're going right at him. Fastball and uh, a little bit high. Tough pitch to hit right here. The fastball up there is uh, pitch his pitch. He is getting a big opportunity because of an injury to Mike Cameron. Fouled away. Well, this is a uh, this is something. If you're Victor Diaz, you take this as a challenge. I mean, they're yeah. They obviously the Astros obviously feel that there's some holes they can exploit. If you're Diaz, thing, you with as much power as you have. The other thing is you get a guy on deck who makes contact. Tom Glavin. Some respect right here for Tom Glavin. Two to Diaz. Diaz is known as a wild swinger. Blue to single to left center in the second inning. Checked in time. Old cutter. And it's 2 2. It was a pretty close call right there. I think he got the benefit. First Pretty base umpire Paul Nout says no. Pettit's going to want to make his pitch right here. So Diaz runs it full. Now well, that breaking ball right there, a pretty obvious pitch because he's got the pitcher coming up next. He's going to try and make him at a ball out of the strike zone. Think so again here, Ralph? Mm -hmm. That ball's right, yes. Oh, definitely. Three, two. Yeah. There's a great temptation when you have those two strikes. That's why it's set to hit the lower part of the batting order. Let's Eighth see if, batter here. Let's see if Andy Pettit gets into temptation and goes into the strike zone. Nope. Hold the string, pitch is low. So Glavin will hit. Two on and two out. This copyrighted telecast presented by authority of Sterling Mets may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Sterling Mets. Second time that Glavin has hit both runners at first and third and two men out. His first time up, he grounded out the short weekly. Think center fielder's playing shallow now, Ralph? It's like wiffle it ball. Really shallow, yeah. Maybe Tavares hit on that. Cut out of the New York skyline that we were greeted by the Shea Stadium grass this morning. That's a nice shot out there, the New York skyline on the outfield grass. Look at it. Wow. I tell you, the groundskeepers did some work. That's really looked great. Well, Glavin has driven in 80 runs in his major league career, and he's had one home run. Yep. They hit well last year. He. Last season, Glavin hit 204. He was 11 for 54. And he only struck out 10 times. That's what Fran has mentioned. He puts the ball in play. But he hit most of his balls to the left side of the field. That's where the Astros are playing. 
Well, you put a bat in anybody's hand, boy, they're dangerous, and this guy is dangerous at the plate. You can't take him for granted. Taking all the way, and it's 1 1. 11 and 1 time, an outstanding hockey player. Got to be a low ball hitter. Yeah. Really like Richie Hebner. Mm -hmm. Another also man. played hockey, yeah. And also from Massachusetts. He also was a grave digger. To Ooh. third. Ensberg kept it in front of him, so he's able to make the play and end the innings. The Mets have now left six on base in the first four innings of the home opener. It's 1 0 Houston. New York Mets baseball brought to you in part by Aflac. Ask about it at work. And folks, a reminder nothing compares to the Mets on MSG Network. In HD TV. Get crystal clear widescreen images and Dolby Digital Sound. The Mets in HD TV available only on IO Digital Cable Service from Cablevision. Well, yesterday, Pedro and Smoltz in a classic pitching matchup. Different kind of pitchers today, but through four innings just as effective. Glavin and Pettit. Turn around and get Clemens here on Wednesday night. As Glavin faces Osmus to begin at the Houston fifth. Don't uh, have the pitchers yet for the weekend, but of course Pedro is going to make his home debut in one of the games against Florida this weekend. I would think we'll see Al Leiter as well. It's a game for the Marlins. Marlon's got two complete games this weekend. Dontre Willis Friday night and Josh Beckett yesterday. Yeah, that's one thing that Jack McKean will do. If he sees that you're in the groove, he doesn't care about the pitch count. He's sort of, sort of uh, old-fashioned. Oh, yeah. Don't forget, tickets still available for Wednesday night when Clemens is on the hill for the Astros and Thursday the finale. And then, as Ted mentioned, the Marlins over the weekend. So, so exciting baseball here at Shea. Jack is a type of guy that uh, defies uh, age. What is he, 75 or 4? 74 years 74, old. 74, yeah. 3 1 now to Osmus. Seven, eight, nine inning here for Glavin. How about when he took uh, the center fielder out of the game, Pierre? He had played every inning of every ball game last year. Throws out Osmus. That to me could be a, uh, the Achilles heel for the Marlins. They need Pierre to win. He had he had a pulled calf muscle, missed most of spring training. He relies on his legs. I can't believe that he will be able to control his effort on the field to the point where he can save that leg. It's got to reoccur sometime, someplace during the course early in the season. Well, he's a uh, he's a good base stealer. Led the leg in hits last year in National League. He's a uh, the catalyst for that ball. Yo, ball. he really is. That's a good point of uh, he was traded for uh, Mookie Wilson's son. So it was a trade of speed for home run, speed and contact for home runs. That's right. But that really is a uh, the antithesis of uh, a trade. One guy could hit home runs and drive in runs. And the guy can steal bases and get bases. And Preston Wilson also can run, as you saw the side of Andy Pettit on deck. That's right. He was a 30 base with uh, bases uh, stealer. Mm -hmm. One ball, one strike here to Willie Tavares. Called out on strikes his first time. Speaking of running, let's the middle. Let's see. Oh, what a period! Oh, oh. How about that? And that did bring a smile to his face. How about that? Bare hands the ball. Takes a tricky hop. He able, he's able to bare hand it, and he can throw a bullet to first base. How about that play by Jose Reyes? Even he took a look at the new Diamond Vision board to take a look at that play again. This is just sick. How do you do this? Oh, what a play. Bad hop, and he adjusts. <laughs> Not bad, Ralph. Well, he is a play barehanded back in the early days of baseball. <laughs> That's the second time in the first week of the season that I've seen a player do that. And the other one was our former Met, Edgardo Alfonso, made a play like that the other day on a ground ball that hit the base. 
Karam up over his head. He reached up with his bare hand, made the out. A terrific. That's play incredible. Ball. It really is to be moving to his left and have to adjust. Now, if we just see an outfielder do the Kevin Mitchell play. Kevin Mitchell. You know, I thought about Kevin Mitchell when he just <laughs> made that play. Catch a fly ball with his bare hand. That'd be something. Oh, Willie Mays did that. On one of his great catches. Is that right? Line drive. Oh, yeah. Caught it with his bare hand. Yes, sir. Three and oh now. Yes. Charlie Dresson, the manager of the Dodgers, said, I'd like to see him do that again. <laughs> <laughs> All in the picture. How about that? Yeah, Glavin just the difference watching them today is that Glavin's throwing more pitches out of the strike zone than Pettit. Glavin's 31 balls, 38 strikes right now. And he walks. They say, hasn't hurt him. So they say at times the toughest pitch to throw over the plate is a 3 0 pitch on a pitcher because you know what? You're not <laughs> supposed to walk him. Well, he walked a better back in the first inning. That's the difference in this ball game. Yep. He scored. And that's been. The pitching woe for the Mets in the first week of the season. Count now is at 13. 13 runners in seven games who reach base either through a walk or hit by pitch have scored against the Mets. Including Biggio in the first inning today. Ever takes a strike. Adam Everett's like Jeff Bagwell he was Boston Red Sox product and the Astros got him a few years back in a trade for Carl, Carl Everett. That's right. He's been a good field questionable hit shortstop all the way through but he finally got last year he hit 273 missed the last six weeks of the year. Had his arm broken when he's hit by a pitch. There's the right field for a hit. That's going to get Biggio to the plate. That's just an annoyance for Tom Glavin because walking Pettit not only has put him in jeopardy in this inning, you see our Panasonic digital replay, but it's going to Every pitch he throws here, it's probably going to take an inning off his potential outing today. On the outside pitch, hit to right field. Let's see, approach most of the hitters take against uh, Glavin. And Biggio with a hit. Let's see if they bring Pettit home. I hope they're going to hold him up. Floyd got it back in. See those two throws on Saturday night scared the Astros. Floyd throwing out two runners at home plate. Well, you've really got to have some courage to wave your starting pitcher home no, to a play no. at the plate. Well, you know what? Teams are running on Cliff, obviously. So any pet it's held at right. third base as Cliff flips the ball into Mike Piazza. Another look at Pettit going to third. They're running some eggs. So. Well, here's your defining moment as our drivers look at the number shows where Biggio is on the all time hit list. Add one there, 2650 now, four behind Ted Williams. But defining moment of the game for you Tom Glavin the, right here. You left the very great hitter off that list. I think he's at one behind Jimmy Fox. Jimmy Fox, one of the greatest hitters of all time, and you never hear anyone talk about him. He had 58 home runs in one season in a shortened season of 154 games, which is what they played in his day. Jeff Bagwell grew up a Red Sox fan. Fox, of course, played for the Red Sox. He also played for the Philadelphia Athletics. And the Philadelphia Phillies. I did, I was hit against it once. 46. It was a pitcher. Bagwell knows what he can do here. He's got the ability to break this thing open. 
I'm glad you don't want to fall behind this guy because he can really they call it a cripple hitter in baseball when a pitcher falls behind this and this guy has made a living. Although not last year surprising but Bagwell's made a living crushing left hand pitcher. 448 home runs in his major league career. It all started with a two out walk to Pettit and then singles by Everett and Biggio. Out of play. So it'll be two and two. Well, Biggio knows what he's going to get. I should say that Jeff Bagwell knows what he's going to get because they face each other a lot as you look at the runners on all the bases. Well, the sound are two things. One is it'll be a fastball, or one it will be a change of pace. A nice scene, scene as most of the 50,000 stand. 3 2. Try oh boy. Well, Glavin really reached back. 88. Trying to get inside. So now Tom Glavin knows he has to throw a strike. So does Jeff Bagwell. This is going to be a battle right here. Bagwell's paid to drive in those runs and he's driven in a lot over the years. Runners will be moving. Oh boy. Oh. Don't throw it there again if you're Tom Glenn. It's okay if he hit a foul. I <laughs> wouldn't want to give him another chance to hit this. No. Well, this is what we're talking about. This walk to pet it. It's cost Glavin another about 10 to 12 pitches already in this inning. Bagwell has hit three career homers off Glavin in 61 at bats. Here they go. Strike three call. Well, Bagwell can't believe it. He wanted to get it inside. He wanted to lock him up. And Tom Glavin makes a pitcher's pitch. Did he get him? I think he yeah. might have a good complaint. Glavin may have just gotten paid back for last Wednesday. Yeah. Well, what a strikeout by Tom Glavin. Did he get him, Ralph? Well, it's pretty close to take uh, right on the border. Three and two. <laughs> I'll say this. Can't Tom, take that pitch. The two pitches Tom Glavin got Cincinnati. through last week in Cincinnati were much better than that. Yeah. And he didn't get either one. And if I'm Bagwell, I'd be upset with that, too. Yeah. It's a, with the uh, bases loaded, Bagwell's paid to drive in runs. Three, two pitch. Bagwell's got a pretty good eye. He's usually a tough man to strike out. So can the Mets now. Turn this into a little momentum their way as they open up at the top of the order. With these three switch hitters, Reyes, Matsui, and Beltron. Something the Mets certainly hope will be an advantage for them. One and two. Not since the 1988 St. Louis Cardinals has a team started its lineup with three switch hitters for half their games. Vince Coleman, Ozzy Smith, Willie McGee. Oh, nasty breaking. He gets Jose Reyes. Uh, Jose at times wants to hit that ball so hard, he jumps at our Panasonic Digital Replay. Ideas for life. Sometimes you just can't hold up and pitch that breaking ball from a left-hander. Jose Reyes way out in front. Well, Pettit did make the mistake there. The last at bat for Reyes in the third inning. Pettit was ahead 0-2 and he threw a ball in the strike zone. And Reyes hit it for a base hit. There, two strikes he made sure it was a ball. The pitch he had up the middle for the base hit, hit was a fastball and of course that was a curve, but Pettit, of course, one of the best pitchers in baseball. He's been really tough. He's had 13 ones in postseason play. One back of the number one guy. The second time Matsui chases a bad ball. So Pettit has five strikeouts and uh, today Matt Lachlan had a chance to ask Craig Biggio about Carlos Beltran. 
it's, it's hard to see a guy for three days or six games. You get an opportunity as a fan to, 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 to see what a guy can do. But obviously, you guys are going to get a lot of games to watch him play. He can, he can hurt you a lot of different ways with his glove, his arm, his speed, and his bat, obviously. And, uh, he's a, and what I always liked about Carlos, not that he was a great player, but he's a better person. And that's what I really enjoyed about him. One strike now to Beltran, as you heard Craig Biggio in our Dodge quote book. Oh, see how Pettit pitches to Beltran. He stayed inside in his last two at bats. And right there, a breaking ball. It's funny, as a pitcher and catcher, you know, you get a guy out a couple times inside, you think, well, he's smart, he's going to start looking for it, so you get away from it. He went back inside. Saw Piazza on deck. Things are getting tougher on Kaz Matsui as he tries to get on track here early in 2005. Carroll played second base yesterday and he got three hits in that game. Carlos so goes he's there. going to have a tough time. A couple of sack bunts in yesterday's ball game. Well, the book, the book is out on Matsui. Everybody in the National League knows it. If you can get ahead in the count, he will swing at balls. Well, so and people throw him, throw him bad pitches and he chases. Well, that's the reason he had the 94 strikeouts yeah. last year. And it's going to be tough to change, and it's it's tough to hit them in the top of the order when you strike out that much. But the lack of discipline is what teams have discovered. Oh yeah, they'll swing down well, on the count. That was the sky report on him in Japan also. Well, he's uh, in his second year in the major leagues, but he's been a veteran ball player ten years in Japan, and highly thought of in Japan, not only offensively but defensively. That was Cairo. You looked at there. Well, now a good runner on the bases at first base. The is the batter. I don't think he'll be running, but the time run is at first base. The of course, has that power. The most hitters by most home runs by a catcher in the history of the game of baseball. And thinking big means they're thinking about a home run for Mike Piazza. The, the, the problem here is if you do send them. Mike Piazza's reputation will be if Beltran steals second base. I think they'd walk Mike to go after Cliff Floyd, the left handed batter. Plus, it's tough to steal on Bennett and Osmonds. Out of Piazza. Mike has fly to left center and struck out swinging. And Mike has been swinging the bat hard at breaking balls, almost Ralph like he's swinging at fastballs. He was struck out in the fastballs one time up. He, was ch he chased those breaking balls with big swings. And it's one two and so this is uh, in the first week of the year the reference we made earlier the Mets have they've done it with long ball they've not been able to get the hit to manufacture runs of course yesterday's big swing inning came on three home runs in the space of four batters I just got a Fastball to hit on the last pitch. One and two. Two and two. Pettit is going to give Houston a lot more to feel good about today just watching the fact he's throwing the ball 88, 89. Yeah, that last pitch, 89 miles an hour. So he's coming back off of arm trouble and throwing the ball hard. And this is much better velocity than he had in his first start against St. Louis. There's that keep them close move to first base. Well, 
this would be a situation where Beltran might take off because if he's thrown out at second base, there's two strikes on Piazza. Piazza will lead off next inning. He's had a uh, short lead at first base. He hasn't taken anything that is a uh, big lead. There's three throws at first base, so they feel that they're going to put Beltran in motion. And if they put him in motion, if Piazza makes contact and splits the outfielders, it's an RBI. Speaking of the outfielders, Tavares, the center fielder, played relatively shallow for Mike Piazza and to hit the ball the other way. This is me, does play shallow. Yeah, see him out there? That's a bouncing one. Ensberg, plenty of time to make the play at first, and the Mets are retired. So we finished five at Shea. The home opener, still 1 0 Houston. We'll be back here Wednesday night on MSG. Geico Mets on deck kicks it off at 6.30, and then the Mets will tackle the Astros and Roger Clemens. First pitch at 10 past 7 right here on MSG, available on HDTV only on cable. Roger is what, 41 years of age? He's going to be 43, actually, in August. Okay. As you look at our cheap game summary, and it's uh, that one RBI hit for Morgan Ensberg with two outs in the first inning. Scored, Bi uh, scored Biggio, who had walked, and that's the only run. Five hits for the Mets and four for the Astros. Glavin goes back out to work the sixth. Tom has thrown 81 pitches, and he will face Ensberg to start the inning. Ensberg with two hits, a double and a single. The double was over the head of the right fielder against the fence, and the single was to left field. They play him straight away. Now we have time call. Yeah, they've got uh, and they uh, sign in center field. Yep, they got to get the sign off. Batter's eye to go back to. That white ball Black. with the um, white letters of that sign where I had to pick up. I tried to do that when the visiting team was up. <laughs> and they're just apparently there's a malfunction for a moment. They can't get the, the batter's eye to turn back into what it should be. Of course, uh, today our first chance to look at some of the new updates around Shea, a brand new video board, great quality in left field. There it is. Not nearly as big as the Atlanta monstrosity, but, uh, but great quality. There's some new video boards rimming the stadium on the face of the suite level. They're going back to having signs uh, being sold on the outfield fences. That Paul Danforth here at Shea does a great job selling those signs. A lot of signs here at Shea Stadium. Lots of new display boards actually with, with information also on the concourses. That's one of the main things when you went to Abbott's Field, they had all the signs on the outfield wall. Right. Sold and uh, the famous one was Abe Stark sign. You hit the sign, you got a suit of clothes, and nobody hit it because Carl Ferrillo cut it off. He got a pair of pants for doing that. By the way, you saw a shot of the production crew here at Chase Dam as you're looking at Willie Randolph just had a conversation with Mark Wagner, the home plate umpire. Well, like, this is not going to be good for Tom Glavin. Tom is very much a creature, oh, I guess all starting pitchers are, but Tom. As much as anybody I've been around, a, a creature of habit. He's, uh, Delays like this do not. Don't he doesn't like that. No, but he's still throwing. He's Might have something to do with the batter's eye. Well, that's what it is. They can't can't play the game until they get that thing fixed. Well, they might not be able to. And uh, of course, at least if they live it up there, it'd be the same for both sides. That's the way it looked. At, only worse at Wrigley Field for years and years. When, is, when did it finally change, Ralph? 1952 or 53. I'm not sure the right time of the year. I was with the Cubs. I had to be 53, I think. And uh, I was the player rep for the Cubs. And I had to go and tell Gallagher, who was the GM of the Cubs, that he had to put a way to black out those seats. 
And so from that day on yeah. when he agreed, they uh, would not sell those tickets. Tom Glavin wants to know what's going on. I think he may leave the field if they can't get that situation resolved. Pedro Martinez is having some fun, I'm sure, with some people in the Houston dugout because it's his yep, it's his mug that's up there. You know, they did two things at Wrigley Field back in the uh, early 50s. They also took the gloves off the field. All the players would throw their gloves on the grass on the field. How about and that? They eliminated, eliminated that. Tom Slavin just like, walked out the field. I'm just telling you, this is not, again, you just, Tom is a guy that's very rigid in his routine, and he just does not want to stand out there until there's some idea that they're going to play the game. Hands are cheering as Pedro is now up on the big video board as well. The big thing, uh, Tom Glavin started the home opener here two years ago, which was his first game as a man. It was also opening day of the season, and the pregame ceremonies ran long, and it threw him off his rhythm. Today, they got things going within a minute. Today, we were only one minute off. Pedro's having a good time. Oh, it's all fun. about that sign. CNHD is believing MSGHD and FSN New York. Well, Pedro would love the pitch with that sign like oh. that. Well, listen to the fans chanting Pedro's name. But they cannot, as far as I understand, unless there's some way they can drape a tarp or canvas or some sort in front of that board, they're not going to be able to play the game without that being fixed, the safety of the players. Willie well, Randolph continue to talk about it with Mark Wegner. We'll take a break and come back to Shen. Well, we're still in a delay at Shea. Tom Glavin went back out during that break because they were attempting to uh, put up some canvases and tarps to block the advertisement in center field. That has not worked. And uh, so now we're up to plan C. I'm well, not sure thing, what that is. The sign out there is saying seen, and that's the problem. You can't see. <laughs> of course, plan A would be to get the sign to go back to uh, its normal. Apparently that isn't working. Everybody's can't get the function. Plan B was these tarps and that's not working. So now mm. the Mets are going to leave the field because uh, again the safety of the players which is the utmost thing here that's the responsibility of the umpires. They can't allow the game to begin with that sign stuck in its position. So now we're in the computer world and the computer will have to be fixed. How about uh, Pedro as you look at Willie Randolph Pedro is in the face of the opposition at all times right now. Pedro had a good time with the fans mm -hmm. concerning his picture up on that board. Well remember our famous phrase you come to the ballpark one of the, the best thing about baseball is you come to a ballpark and you're always going to see something you've never seen before. This qualifies mm -hmm. in the batter's eye Mike. I don't think That's I've ever problem. I'm ever aware of this kind of a delay before in a game. I've never seen it, Ralph. I don't think I have. Of course, at one time they didn't have a batter's eye in ballparks. <laughs> the worst one that I can remember in recent years, Ralph, was Fenway Park. Well, up he, until up until about the mid to late '80s, and they still had fans sitting in the dead center field area. Well, they with, they with, stopped it when Tony Canigliaro got hit in the face. Yeah, they, they but started. I, I want to say when Oil Camp Boyd was pitching, or some some other incident there. Um, this Canigliaro's incident was more of a, a pitch that was had a little extra on it from uh, Jack yeah, Hamilton. Jack right? Hamilton yeah, exactly. was a pitcher. Yeah, he had a little, were, little something extra on the pitch. They were still concerned with the, the yeah. folks sitting out there but, in center field. But I know into the late '80s, they were still concerned with the shirt sleeves in dead center field, right above the big wall at Fenway. I think they've resolved it. They can always go to the concession stands. Get some good food here, Jay. <laughs> Well, championship boxing will return to the garden Saturday, April 30th. Don King Productions in association with MSG will present the WBA World Heavyweight Championship. John Ruiz defends against James Lights Out Tony. Call Ticketmaster's number you see there for tickets, or you can log on to thegarden.com, or as always, visit the MSG box office. So we'll continue while we wait out this delay at Shea Stadium. 
after five, one nothing Houston. We are now 12 minutes into this delay because of the malfunctioning batter's eye in center field. And Glavin waiting and hoping they can fix this issue. A reminder, Wednesday night, first time Pepsi will invite you to show up at Shea for free admission to the Pepsi picnic area this season. The first 1,000 fans with an empty Pepsi can or bottle will be admitted free to watch Roger Clemens face the Mets' Kaz Ishii Wednesday night, 7-10 first pitch. Tickets still available for that ball game, and then the final game will be Thursday, and then the Marlins. Those Florida Marlins will be in town Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Now they've rebooted the computer apparently and they're getting the sign to move a little bit. It looks like they've just about got it done, which that means they should unplug it. <laughs> so it stays that way for the rest of the game. You get to a point here, we're now what, 12 minutes, almost 13 minutes in, where you start to be concerned for the starting pitchers. More so Pettit because Houston's still gonna be the or Houston still has to bat here. Glavin comes back out here and he'll warm up again. So we're set to go now, Ralph. And the whole thing is you wonder if you were unable to fix the problem, the Mets could forfeit this game and they would be on the losing side. Well, they're going to they're going to play it obviously and Tom Glavin out there taking his warm up tosses. I don't think it'll affect Tom a whole lot. You get a chance to sit in that dugout and he's got a power pitcher so fans reacting to it being completely fixed out there in the batter's eye but so it shouldn't affect Tom Glavin at all or the <laughs> Astro hitters. Well there's some guys who did some great work. Some guys that are shimmying along the top of that batter's eye to make sure that it completely closed there they are that's yeah, they terrific. Did a great, those did two a great gentlemen job. right there well, that's not easy right that's there. A, that was some, that's Good that's luck. manual labor and uh, they did it they did it they got it fixed so we will now resume after a 14 minute delay and it'll be Glavin facing Ensberg one nothing Houston sixth minute Innsberg with a couple of blows in today's game one to right field off the wall and one to left field. <laughs> and Glavin that pitch was his 82nd. And it's right about at the same number. Dan Wheeler now is up in the Houston bullpen. Two and oh. Lane and then Burke will follow. Glavin doesn't get the outside. Three and oh. Got the inside. Remember to really stay in this game. Maybe. Getting Bagwell looking with the bases loaded in the fifth. Way inside. Hey. That's a strike. Because of the uh, wind now and the blustery mess of the day, you can see Glavin's a lot to blow on his pitching hand while he's on the mound. The sun's out, it's very pleasant. That's outside and a leadoff walk. Third issued by Glavin to bring in Jason Lane, who's grounded out twice. And one of the walks is first back in the first inning. Scored, so that's the difference in the ball game. Home openers today, and not just here, of course, Milwaukee playing its home opener this afternoon in the National League. Five home openers in the American League, three of them today, including, of course, the uh, celebration in Boston. 
And I loved Pedro Martinez's response when he was asked if he was going to go to get a ring today. And I don't have any problem with a player that does. Derek Lowe, I know, left the Dodgers to go get his in person. But Pedro said, no, I have a new job, new team, new responsibility. Well, he was invited like to the that. White House along with uh, Doug Mankiewicz. When they were in Florida, Doug Mankiewicz uh, went to his cell phone at lunchtime and had a, a message, uh, you're invited, you know, we, you're invited to the White House with us on Monday. It was like Friday. And they said, uh, call us back right away. And in the meantime, if you can ask Pedro if he wants to go also. So uh, obviously Doug and, uh, and Pedro turned down the invitation because they felt they had to do some work down in Port St. Lucie. Not the strike. Lane not happy. One and two. Well, it's clear that it, the strike zone's a little more generous on the inside. Good job. Right now of, on the outside. Good job of framing by uh, Piazza. This is a good uh, position for the runner of first base, and he takes for ball two. Lensberg's the man that was caught trying to steal. Piazza threw him out in the fourth inning. You know, in, talk, in talking to Doug Mankiewicz, uh, he said that they would have loved to have gone to Boston if the opportunity, you know, if they didn't have to do their work in Port St. Lucie, they would have enjoyed joining the Red Sox at the White House. A pop up behind first. Can Matsui get there? Yes. A good range there for Matsui. Mankiewicz would not have been able to recover to field that. Well, Matsui struggling with the bat. In fact, roundly booed here at Shea Stadium, and he tracks this ball down and makes the grab. Has Matsui trying to get into the good graces of the fans here at Shea Stadium. So here's Chris Burke. He is uh, the number one rookie prospect in the Houston organization. And like so many other players here, it's changed positions. Chris Burke was a All-American shortstop at Tennessee. He was a first-round pick by Houston. They moved him to second base, and that's what he played in the minor league system. And now this year, Biggio's back at second. Burke's learning to play the outfield. There goes the runner. Piazza's throw, and not there. It was a hop that cost Reyes to not be able to get the tag down in time. When the ball bounces, your glove, you have to give with the ball so your glove will come up, whether it's in front of the bag or behind the bag. Here's the throw, and the ball bounces, and just watch the glove. Unable to come back with the glove in time, but you got to give with the ball in order to receive. This is pretty good right here, though. Reyes didn't have to come up that high with the glove. Once that ball bounces, it's difficult for an infielder, especially with a runner coming into second base. That was a hit and run play right there, and they batter failed to protect the run, and they still got yep. the stolen base. Well, Phil Garner in his managing career has been just like what Willie Randolph has said he wants his Mets to be very aggressive running teams. That'll be a broken bat foul out of play. Like anything else, managing in this city is a lot different. Just like playing in this city is different than playing or managing in any other town, city. Of course, they get some tough cities in Boston and Philadelphia. You think? <laughs> they, they have an edge. How about Pittsburgh? Nah. That was tough. When? All the time. <laughs> Not on you. I hit three home runs in a game and I grounded that my fourth time up and they booted. <laughs> Got the inside. Well, it's just, it's very obvious right now that Mark Wegner's strike zone is inside oriented. And there it is, and that's a good pitch. Take a look at it from up above, and I changed my that mind. Was it wasn't that good a pitch. But that's what, I mean, it's been very clear. That is the uh, sixth strikeout by Glavin. And it appears that Piazza and Glavin have, have adjusted to that. But Tom's not getting anything off the outside at all. But he's getting pitches off the inside. So the ball 
ball here to Osmus. They have those six strikeouts from Glavin. Four have been looking. You know, one of the things about Osmus is that he is now one for 33 against Tom Glavin. Now, do you look at it like he's due or it will continue? Which way do you go? I go, it's going to continue. <laughs> <laughs> right center, Diaz puts it away, and Glavin survives that long delay and a leadoff walk. And he keeps this game where it is. One nothing Astros to the bottom of the sixth. Receive a voucher for a free hot dog. Head out to Shea for kids opening weekend presented by Nathan's on Saturday, April 16th and Sunday, April 17th. See the Mets battle the Florida Marlins. The first 6,000 kids each day will receive a voucher for a free hot dog and a baseball card pack. For more information or to purchase tickets, call the Mets ticket office at 718-507-TIXX. Now don't miss kids opening weekend right here at Shea. So how about this, Fran? This Pettit is back out there. How many opening days would you guess, Fran, this makes for Ralph Kiner? Well, you know what, Ralph? I yeah, I know the answer. I'd hate to. Well, give me a whisper to my ear. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> that really should have been our well, half-like today. It's over, uh, well, all the ones were the Mets. Well, how about the other ones? And the other ones are uh, 10 in the major leagues, three in the minors, and uh, I had five as a GM of the San Diego Padres in the Coastal League. 63. 63. Wow. 63 opening days. That's great. And you, and you usually toast opening day, don't you? Well, you celebrate. That's right. You've been celebrating 63 of them. I love it. That's a lot. It's a lot of work, is it, that celebration? <laughs> I never thought of it that way. <laughs> It's it's quite a it's quite a uh, atmosphere the home opener isn't it? Uh, you always uh, it's a great feeling because you know it's the start of a new year and you're out there and uh, you got to wait and see what's going to happen. You hope everything works right. There was a different buzz today. You know with the, the introduction of Pedro Martinez and Carlos Beltran and the rest of the Mets. This place was alive. It was jumping. Now Cliff Floyd will start the sixth for the Mets. Now. The Astros sent Pettit out after a long time. Manny Ibar is getting ready in the Mets bullpen. Glavin at 96 pitches may be finished. I think there's some action also in the and Astros. To say Houston is backing up. They're ready with somebody just in case Pettit's not right here. Pettit with more of an assortment of pitches than Tommy Glavin, so could have a negative effect. Get that fastball, the breaking ball. And it's former Met Dan Wheeler. Dan Wheeler and John Franco are now the, the seventh inning combo for Houston. I pop foul. And that'll drift out of play. You know, talking about opening day, Tom Seaver had 16 appearances on opening day, which is an all time high for a pitcher in baseball. For Three different teams, right? I don't think he ever pitched opening day for the Red Sox, did he? Um, yeah, but the White Sox are right. White Sox, Cincinnati, and Mets. Right. Ooh, well, that is a good pitch, and that's a that's a tough one to take. Floyd got the doubt, benefit of the doubt. That's low. No question about that. Three and two now. That's got to get something going right here. And a good good start. Ooh. And Floyd does it with a broken bat base hit. So Cliff Floyd with a good at bat. Three and two. And 
Breaks his bat, but strong enough to move the ball into the outfield. So Cliff Floyd's on first base, and that bat is gone. Here it is again, Ralph. Well, it's a fastball hit off the end of the bat, splits the bat in half, and the Mets have the time run on the first base. No one out. Bottom half of the sixth inning, and the batter will be David Wright. I tell you, if you're looking for long-term omens for this Mets season. The way Floyd has hit lefties in the first week is a, is a good one. Yeah, he's had some good years against left-handers and some bad. Looks like he might be on the right track this year against lefties. Here's the kid that can do some damage right now, David I'll Wright. And I tell you, if you pitcher right now, you've got to pitch inside because that's where Mark Wagner, that pitch there to right. Mark Wagner's giving strengths. David Wright was jammed his first time up and doubled sharply his second time up. Okay, they're going, but he fights that off, and it falls for a hit. Floyd stopped to be sure and nearly swallowed his heart because Jason Lane came close to catching. And it's a good thing that Lane bobbled that ball. He had to play at second base for a forced play as Wright gets his second end of the ball game. Great shot of David Wright muscling the ball in the right field. Here's Cliff Floyd. He had to be somewhat cautious. Then he had to turn it on to get to second base. So now the Mets are runners on first and second. And Doug Mankiewicz will be the batter. And now what do you do? They're going to talk it over as a pitching coach goes out to the mound. Well, some of it may be decided by what happens here. Does Phil Garner make a change? Well, you got Mankiewicz, the left-hander. You got uh, Diaz behind him, but you also have... Tom Glavin, who probably has a shot of coming out of this ball game if so directed. You got the abutment cave, which I'll tell you, is a contact hitter, Ralph. Moves the ball around. There's Dan Wheeler. First time in this ball game, the Mets have rivers at first and second with no one out. And do you bunt here or do you? Ooh, boy, it's a tough one. Well, make a call of hit and run? I, I'd rather have him swing the bat because he does make contact. Yep. The one thing, of course, that you just can't afford here, and this is maybe going through Willie Randall's mind, you just can't afford a double play. Right. That That's kills right. your inning. But Willie, Willie isn't a great, he's going to be an aggressive manager. He's going to go with his gut instinct also. A little looking for the bunt. Be a good time to let him swing. Perfect. Perfectly done. Perfectly done. Okay, I tell you that. Listen, you know what? That's what you love about New York baseball. Listen, the fans, they understand. That's been a shortcoming of the Mets in recent years, and Mankiewicz just executes this perfectly on the first pitch. Here it is again, Doug Mankiewicz, the head of that bat above the ball. It's perfect. So now it's up to Victor Diaz or a pinch hitter. And Victor's going to bat here. He's had a base hit in this game of blue pit that Cinderella saw his walk, but now the time run at first, third base. Tom Graham is on on deck. Graham's on deck, but he's not going to hit. Willie Randolph looking, I believe, for a pinch hitter. So now the they question can't. is do they pitch to Diaz? Yeah. You can't. Well, they have the luxury of walking in, but the Mets would have a pinch hitter coming up. I'd rather face a pinch hitter than a guy who's had a couple of ABs. They're the runners. You saw Floyd and Wright. Tavares very shallow again, just a little bit toward right center. Strike 1-1, one, one. Valent ready. And the off speed bits right there on a count of one ball and no strikes. You saw two hitters there. Chris Woodward, a right hand batter, was getting ready in the Met dugout as well. One for Wheeler and one for Pettit. Outside. Now Phil Garner could make. And this is at all depending on what Diaz does here, but he could make the Mets waste a hit. Also, you can you, know, you can you can line up a double play. Look at those numbers for Pettit: 97 pitches, 63 strikes. Wheeler in the bullpen. If you put Diaz at first, you get the bases loaded. Double play situation. You push Tom Glavin out of the ball game. He's not going to get a good pitch here. That's for sure. With Pettit on the mound, he's going to have to hit Pettit's pitches. That was a better pitch than I'm with you. That was yeah. a better pitch than I thought he'd see. 
Pettit got it in on him. He got it in on him, tied him up, and the ball fouled the other way. Cutter, 2-2 two -two now. If you're an experienced hitter, you know that you're going to be pitched as tough as you can be. up down the right field line it's going to fall foul and actually right into the first row well Andy Pettit being shown some confidence here by Phil Garner next pitch will be 100 and they're letting Pettit in just his second start back from Elbow surgery, second regular season start. Try to get this crucial out. Well, the one thing is, we mentioned this earlier in the uh, ball game. Pettit has the best record ever of any pitcher that has pitched in New York City. His winning percentage is the best in the history of the game in New York. Second to him yep. is Lefty Gomez. It is two and two to Diaz with one out. Infield is back all the way. Ooh. And I guarantee you right now, Jeff Bagwell at first base has got steam coming out of his ears. That was the same bits that was called a strike right. and Bagwell with the bases open. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Bagwell's thinking, whoa, what's wrong with that again? Well, we see what's wrong with it, but Bag <laughs> Bagwell doesn't. Well, now the crowd roars, and Diaz has to channel his anxiousness. He does the job to right. Well, maybe not. Let's see. Coming in. The ball falls. Misplayed by Lane. Floyd scores right to third, and the game is tied. What a good break for the Mets. The ball should have been caught. I believe the run would have scored from third base. But though it was not cut, so still only one out. So you go back to Minkiewicz's butt that really helped out after a couple of base hits. And here's Diaz. Ball looked like it was Miami. He was able to muscle the ball in the right field. And unfortunately for the Astros, Jason Lane got a bad jump in the ball. In fact, I don't think he picked it up right away. It looked like he broke back, then had to come in. Another look, you see Floyd going back to third base. And everybody's surprised. The ball drops in in front of Jason Lane. An enthusiastic Met dugout. So the Mets finally break through against Pettit. They have tied the game. For a moment there, it looked like Glavin was going to hit. But now he has been called back. And Miguel Cairo is Willie Randolph's choice. And this is an interesting one because this... I think it's Willie Randolph's way of saying, I'm not going to burn a hitter. If you make a pitch and change and bring Wheeler in, to Houston, I'm still going to leave Cairo up there. And Cairo obviously gives you the uh, option here of a bunt. And Pettit is going to stay in the ball game. So Glavin is down. Ibar will likely be the ne met, next Met pitcher. Rights at third, Diaz at first with one out. Well, Tom Glavin, if you recall last year, first half of the season, pitched lights out and didn't get much run support. So base hit here might show that this year could be different for Tom Glavin if the Mets can give him some run support. Carroll took a big swing. Tom Glavin pitched lights out first half of last year and just didn't get the support he needed. Here's Cairo going after that pitch, swinging right through it. had a lot of experience against Pettit. 30 career at bats, eight hits. Cairo seems to be, he, he seems to be becoming a fan favorite here at Shea Stadium early. He had a nice spring train swinging a bat as you look at Jose Reyes on deck. Cairo played yesterday's ball game. Willie Randolph is quoted as saying that Matsui will be back in the lineup tomorrow, which is today, and he is back in the lineup at second base. Yes. 
It'll pop up behind short. Everett stumbles. Mets have the lead. And Cairo continues as a fan favorite with just a little exposure here at Shea Stadium. Well, Sandy Pettit, it's frustration. To Willie Randolph, these are like two blasts off the wall, these two hits yeah, by Diaz yeah, and Willie, Cairo. Willie Randolph had to wait a while for his first victory right there. Randolph, I'm sure, responsible for getting Cairo to the Mets. And Cairo again pays dividends for the Mets and Willie Randolph. Look at the effort stumbling. If he doesn't stumble, he has a shot. And yeah. David Wright cheering him on. Scores the go-ahead run, and this place is rocking. The excitement in the Mets dugout. Everett turned one way and then tried to spin back the other way, and that's when he stumbled. So Tom Glavin now sits and watches the Mets take the lead. We'll get a pitching change as Phil Garner comes to remove Pettit, who pitched gamely today, over 100 pitches and four singles by the Mets here in the sixth inning. It produced two runs and the lead. Don Glavin, who so often, as Fran said, was unrewarded last year, has gotten two runs on his ledger. Andy Pettit pitched beautifully for Houston. He did. He threw the ball well. He got the ball in the high 80s after having some arm trouble, Ralph. It's did a great job. And uh, he was unfortunate in as much as his outfielder and right field lane misplayed the ball that should have been in and out. Now the infield is at double play depth at second and short. So Dan Wheeler, who spent much of 03 and 04 with the Mets, comes in to face Reyes with two on and one out. It's going to be a tough man to double up. They're willing to give up the run by playing back here. Hmm. And off speed stuff from Wheeler. Reyes one for three today with Matsui behind him. Of course, now the switch hitters flip back to bat from the left side for the Mets. Dan Wheeler was traded. The Mets traded him to Houston at the end of August last year to help the Astros bullpen in their run to make the playoffs. And as you see, Glavin's final line. Wheeler pitched magnificently in Houston. It was as if he was reborn. As fouls it back, culminating, how about this, in the LCS last year, Dan Wheeler, at its line. Pitched seven innings against St. Louis in the LCS and really gave up no runs, four hits, no walks, and nine strikeouts. Mighty strong there. And he gets Reyes, but he threw nothing there. Breaking balls. So uh, Jose Reyes is really anxious right now. Watch him go after this pitch, Ralph. Out of the strike zone. Yep. It's, he was pitch tough, but you got to be uh, got to be really cautious when you're hitting in a situation like this. Now tough job for Matsui. Matsui has struck out twice. Good slider there by Wheeler. He's just, he's got a good slider, good sinker. Runners take off. Oh, and a terrific play by Ensberg to save a run. Up a double steal, two outs. Left handed hitter at the plate. It's a great time to throw ball, especially a guy like Osmus who has an excellent throwing arm. Obviously, the sign was given because both guys broke at the same time. Well, the Mets, you watch that, you realize the Mets know something about Wheeler. They have a pattern. Got a good jump yeah. at the second base to get the third. That's what that that's a scouting report on the pattern of Wheeler. I mean, once he comes set, he looks once, for example, and then comes home. Kaz yes. trying to bunt. Matsui. Beat it out. Run scores. How about that? 
Two outs, drags a bunt. You don't hear that very often, dragging a bunt. They're usually it. pushing a bunt. Did it perfectly. He did. It was a foot race for Wheeler, and he beats him. A drag bunt by Kaz Matsui, and it's a beauty. The bag was a good feeling for his base, and that's why it was close. Another look. The drag bunt by Matsui. Picture perfect, and he beats Wheeler to first base. Great camera work right there. Again, Matsui. Wins the foot race, the Mets pick up another run, and Beltran's at the plate. Well, yesterday it was Beltran that started the big inning, and it was an inning of big flies for the Mets. This inning has been little ball, bloops, bleeders, bumps, and, and Kaz, bags. And that's how Kaz Matsui can really help his, his cause with the fans here in New York, with man, helping to manufacture a run. Don't forget that double steal. That was a big play. That's good. Mm -hmm. Those are the two bags they stole. First and third here, two out. You know, usually when, when you catch it, it's a double steal. If, if the guy in front and second base is running on his own, the runner at first doesn't get as good a jump, and that's why you go after the back runner. But both of them got a good jump, so it had to be a sign from Willie Randolph. That was a beautiful play to watch if you're a baseball fan. Well, once Carlos check up, but the beautiful thing about it was it was perfectly executed, of course, by, by Matsui. Houston played that as well as you could. Yeah. Bagwell and Wheeler could not have played that bunt any better. Here's that last pitch. Yeah, Matsui laid down a perfect bunt. You know, I mentioned that drag bunt. You don't hear that very often. It's usually they're pushing it. He dragged that ball toward first base. Well, Willie Randolph's going to be very aggressive because he was an aggressive player. He was a base stealer. And it might show with these kids because they get some guys that can run in this ballpark. Well, this is an inning that's going to make Willie Randolph smile. Just to see the Mets be able to execute and score without the long ball. Golfed in the air to right field, but didn't get enough of it. And Jason Lane puts it away. Well, Ralph, it's been a pleasure having you with us for your, I lost track, 63rd opening day. Is that what you said? 63rd, yes. I hope the next 63 are as much fun. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right. And the Mets, with a three-run sixth, take the lead at Shea. To the seventh we go, and as the Mets go to the bullpen, they know they've got nine outs to record before they can put this win away. And anybody who's paid attention to baseball the first week of the year knows that one of the two or three ringing stories around the game has been the fact that bullpens all over have had a rough goal. And Manny Arbar will be the first man out of the Met bullpen here this afternoon before the sold out house at Shea. There's been a lot of late game hitting all around the game. Man. Obviously, folks here in New York saw it last week. The best bullpens in the game have been lit up a little bit this first week. So now Ibar will face Willie Tavares, then Orlando Palmero, who entered in a double switch with Wheeler. And finally, Adam Everett. For Houston, Palmero is in left field. He's batting ninth. The pitcher is now in the sixth spot. Tavares in his last at bat hit a ground ball up the middle that took a wickedly bad hop. And Jose Reyes made as fine a play as you've seen, bare handing the ball as it was hopping behind him and throwing out the fleet footed Tavares. Now, like the other night in Houston, some scouts with stopwatches scouted Tavares from the right-hand batter's box to first base in 3.54 seconds, which is extraordinary. Well, they say the fastest, although it's been disputed lately, it was Mickey Mantle at 3-1, but it's hard to believe that the man, I mean, he could run, but 3-1, Ralph? Don't think so. Mm -hmm. And a change, a little bit of a change up there, I believe, that got him. Well, Tavares is out, and there's one away. Mm -hmm. 
And a reminder, Wednesday night at MSG, the Mets and the Astros continue to battle at Shank. Geico Mets on deck comes your way at 6.30 with Matt Lachlan. Then the Mets and the Astros take the field at 7 Wednesday night right here on MSG. Available in HDTV only on cable. So here's the first at-bat now for Orlando Palmero, veteran. Good pinch hitter, man off the bench for Houston. Ibar quickly gets two strikes. Manny Ibar, 32 years old, spent last year pitching in Mexico when he was healthy. His last big league experience. Just inside was with the San Francisco Giants. 2002, he was actually on their postseason roster. And then just a little cup of coffee in 03. Ibar's best big league time was uh, with St. Louis, his first team back in the late 90s. Pulled fair pass first. Mitkevich was off the line, and Palmero got it down to the corner. And he is going to hold it. No, he's coming to third as that ball. Gets Aaron, gets free coming back in, and Palmero ends up at third base. Well, they missed the, missed the cutoff, man. They hit the cutoff, man. They get a shot at him at third base. He was going all the way. Look at this. Ball hit right down the first baseline, down into the corner. And Diaz gets over there, throws the ball back in. We talked about his strong arm right there. It just hurt the Mets. He overthrew the cutoff, man. They have a shot, I believe, at third base if. Victor Diaz hits the cutoff, man. Palmero, look out. How about that? Over his shoulder. He's going to go for it. See, I'm going to tell you that. Now, that replay is very telling because Doug Mancellino, the third base coach, was holding him up at second. He had both arms up in the air. He did not want Palmero to go. If they hit the cutoff, man, they have a real good shot at third base. That was all on the runner. So you sometimes hear that old baseball axiom pick up your third base coach, and then you watch guys at this level, they don't do it. He's doing, he's doing this completely on his own. Yeah, it's like Willie Mays looking over his shoulder. And then you're right, Ted. He's on his own right there. And again, if they hit the cutoff, man, they do have a shot at third base. Now the Astros can get a run back here if Everett puts a ball in play. Ball one strike. Everett one for three, a single his last time up. Biggio and Bagwell behind him. So this uh, it becomes a significant out for Ibar to get. even if a run scores on it. And a run will score, and there's no out. Everett, nice job of hitting. And the Astros are back within one. Well, we talked about Everett earlier last year. He had a relatively solid year offensively. And right there, just goes with the pitch. Driving in a run. So with one out, the Mets now have a one-run lead. So that double steal looms even larger. There's the base hit to right field. We're just saying about bullpens again. It's amazing how much scoring has been done against bullpens the first mm. week of the season. Now Biggio, a walk, a strikeout, and a single. Used to be hitters would rather face that starting pitcher for four at bats. Now they're enjoying some success against middle relievers and closers. Now for most of his career, Biggio has been a guy. But you didn't worry about this situation if you're Houston as, as Roberto Hernandez is going to get up now for the Mets. Vigia was impossible to double up. Just a little bit older now. Still runs okay. He's had a terrific career as you look at Everett at first base. Vigia at one time was a big base stealer. Tough to throw out. Third, David Wright's going to have to go to first base with it, and just in time. Well, you know, it, it, it just goes to show you David Wright does have a good throwing arm. He thought about second base. Everett had a good jump off first. No play there, so he's able to double pump and go across the infield and get Biggio by a step. Biggio still gets time, but there it is. Good, good adjustment by David Wright, and he's able to flip it across the infield. So now the Mets have a question. 
And it's a little bit like the question I think teams face against the Mets now with Mike Piazza. Is this the Jeff Bagwell or right. is it a Jeff Bagwell that That's might right. be just slipping a little bit? Well put. Innsberg with two hits in this ball game, but Jeff Bagwell always dangerous. And once he gets it going, watch out. And the reputation of Bagwell is extraordinary. But well, he's had two home runs so far this year, does. four RBIs. I'd be very careful with him. Slider away. Bagwell playing despite an extremely painful shoulder that's hampered in the last couple of years and won't get better. Can't he, fix it. He told me that if he was still a third baseman, he'd be out of the game. Springer getting ready in the bullpen. But Bagwell was a third baseman. Wouldn't be playing if he was still a third baseman. He's able to play because he's a first baseman and he doesn't have to throw that often. He can still swing the bat. Yeah, that's one right back there. And again, the Again today, that's the, the decision that's been made by the home plate umpire. That pitch on the outside is not a strike. I'd look to be the exact replica of the first pitch he threw. They don't go, they say they don't want to go into Bagwell, but you're not going to get that pitch called a strike today. Willie Randolph looking on after his big victory yesterday in Atlanta when the Mets came back and beat the Braves. They got hot in the eighth inning. Now the Mets have a shot at winning their home opener. There goes the runner to third. Bagwell pops it up foul. So Adam Everett taking off for third base there, which shouldn't be all that significant. A lot of aggressive base running in this ball game. You see Everett. With the big lead on second, takes off. Bagwell fouls the ball off. Two strikes on Bagwell, two and two. So if you get thrown out at third base, Bagwell leads off the next inning. But they want Bagwell right now to drive in the run. Which is what you don't want if you're used to. Right. Bagwell lead. Tap slowly. David Wright has to hurry. So Ibar gets a big series of outs after a run scores. He gets Biggio and Bagwell. So it's now 3-2 Mets as we join the public address announcer of Shea Stadium, Alex Anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and direct your attention to the top of the Mets dugout for the singing of God Bless America to be performed today by Italian tenor Michael Amante as we honor all the heroic men and women who keep our nation safe and free. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the ocean wide with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Amante. Well, there's the score of the Mets on top of the Astros, three to two. You see 10 hits in this ball game for the Mets, six for the Astros. Well, yesterday the Mets did it with the long ball, but this afternoon here at Shea Stadium, they did it with little ball. But this guy doesn't play a little ball right here. Mike Piazza will lead it off. Doug Mankiewicz, by the way, big bunt. In the inning where the Mets picked up three runs in the bottom of the sixth. I think the Mets would like to add. That's what they'd like to do. Yeah. <laughs> they feel a lot more comfortable adding on. They'd like to play some long ball right now. Dan Wheeler did a very nice job when he came on in the sixth. Struck out Reyes. Matsui dragged Bunnett for a hit. 
got Beltron in a fly ball, so. Wheeler has uh, been a very dependable man for Houston. Ooh. Mike rips it, and Ensberg snags it. Well, we talked about the long ball yesterday in Atlanta against those Braves. Mets got their first victory, but here's little ball broken bad base hit by Floyd. A muscled base hit by Wright in the bunt by Doug Mankiewicz. Runners move along. And of course, Victor Diaz then fights off a fastball and loops into right field. And a base hit to drive in a run. And Miguel Cairo then steps to the plate. The pinch hitting roll pops the ball to left field. So it was little ball for the Mets. How about the double steal? With two outs. And a beautiful drag bunt by Kaz Matsui driving in a run. And that scores three runs playing some little ball here at Shea Stadium. The other thing that stands out early this year for the Mets, Ted, is the way the infielders can rush to their throws to first base because of the confidence they have in Doug Mankiewicz. Uh, no question. No but question. Saw David Wright on a ball that ended the top of the seventh inning. When he got Bagwell at first base, he got that ball flipped at the first with a great deal of confidence as Mr. Koo warms up. So it's two strikes to Floyd, one out, nobody on. Houston's in the eighth inning will have Ensberg, Lane, and the pitcher spot. It's a four, five, and six spots in their order. David Wright will follow Floyd. Another, oh, it looks like maybe 10 minutes or so, and I think the uh, shadows are going to start to be a factor. The rim of the stadium is going to start crossing home plate. So that makes it a little tougher for the hitter. See if he can score some runs right now. Get the upper hand when those shadows play a role. Just a big breaking ball there gets Floyd two down. Little slider there by Wheeler. So two down. David Wright is two for three. Floyd started the sixth inning with a base hit off Pettit. Then David Wright flared one into right field for a hit. And he was over the Mets at three. Houston got one back at the top of the seventh. On the ground. The third. Boy, really has looked good. The Mets go in order. We'll go to the eighth. Three, two, New York. Eighth inning. Manny Ibar still on the mound for the Mets. Edsburg, the cleanup batter for Houston. New catcher for the Mets. Ramon Castro back behind the plate. Edsburg fouls it straight back. The Mets have the bullpen ready. Lefty Koo, righty Hernandez. Leaves it up. Two balls and a strike. It's Berg to be followed by Jason Lane and then a pinch hitter. Outfield straight away. Pitch at the knees. Still get it up there. 92. Russ Springer in the Astros bullpen. Likely to work the bottom of the eighth. Well, Innsberg with two hits in today's ball game. A couple of years ago, he had a real good season for the Astros. Might have been their most valuable player. And then had a shockingly unproductive season yeah. last year for mm -hmm. him. Now he's in a 3 2 count. Bar has to come in with a strike here. And Ensberg rips it to the gap. And the Astros will have the tying run in scoring position here. A leadoff double by Morgan Ensberg. 
three hits in this afternoon's ball game for the Astros third baseman. I bar game a pitch he could drive and he drove it. Take a look at it again. I bar going after him with a fastball over the heart of the plate and Innsberg smoking the ball in the left center field. So he cruises in the second base with a double. Look at that. That's good contact. Laid a head down on the ball. Didn't overstride, didn't overswing. Well, it's the seventh inning, the eighth innings. Rick Peterson on the phone, but this is the challenge right now. Ibar has not uh, been able to calm things down here. Jason Lane, right center field. Diaz misses it. Game will be tied, and the lead run is on its way to third. Got to be caught. Ball got past Victor Diaz in right field. He's scattered report is he's an offensive player, does have a good throwing arm, has struggled with the glove. And that ball right there getting past him. Could cost him. That's the game. Here's again. Diaz coming in, was unsure of whether or not to try and catch that ball at the last moment, dove for it. Tough to dive and backhand the ball. See Innsberg going around scoring easily. He thought the ball was going to be caught. And once again, the ball driven into right field. So Lane picks up. I guess he'll be scoring a hit, and he picks himself up a triple with nobody on now here in the eighth inning. It's all tied at three. And the Mets now will bring Mr. Koo out of the bullpen with the lead run at third and nobody out. So Ibar unable to protect the lead for Tom Glavin. And Glavin now will get a no decision today. Another, unfortunately for Glavin, another frustrating outcome where Tom pitched certainly well enough today to earn a victory. Well, it's up to Mr. Koo right now. Ibar out of the ball game. And again, the ball just get, it got past Victor Diaz. Diaz, as we mentioned, known as an offensive player and a ball that would have been caught if he was proficient well, as a defensive player and it, you know he, you turn that glove you try to backhand it it's tough. New York Mets baseball brought to you in part by XM Satellite Radio. Get live play by play of Major League Baseball games for every team all season long on XM Satellite Radio. And by Tri-State Lincoln Mercury dealers check out the new models at LincolnMercury.com. Well, Mr. Koo now in the ball game. It's up to him with nobody out to shut him down. This is a tough outing right here for Mr. Koo with the runner on third. And that's the lead runner standing down there at third base. Well, it's uh, Willie Randolph had some introduction to managing the first week. Oh, you? boy. And uh, he, obviously he's got a patchwork bullpen that is trying to find out who can do the job and who maybe needs to or where positions need to be fixed. Pretty much they're still and, trying out. And yeah, and here's a situation where Willie made a defensive switch in this inning. He put Castro back behind the plate, but chose to stick with Diaz, who was not a defensive player in right field. And as often happens in baseball, the ball found him. Yeah, it's tough. To, I mean, tough to throw defensive players out there for <laughs> well, every position. You get my football, well, defensive say, and offensive. No, and the Mets don't have. Here it is again. Watch this. Now watch the way he turns his glove. That, that's tough. And the ball got by him. And Victor he's Diaz got, will tell you, I should have caught it. Exactly. Either catch it or get a block the ball. Well, you know, if he blocked it, he'd have blocked the fly ball. Yeah. <laughs> Could have been a first. Well, here's Mr. Kuna out of face. The pinch hitter for Houston, Jose Vizcaino. Mets have had to bring the infield in. Look at Vizcaino. Wax the first one over Floyd's head. To the wall and over for a ground rule double. Well, Vizcaino has had a real good major league career right there driving in a run the go ahead run for the Astros jumps on the first pitch he's comes out swinging Lane scores after the triple and this guy you know doubles watch him go after this pitch bang over the heart of the plate and he turned on it hit the ball over Cliff Floyd's head in left field so Tommy Glavin will not walk away with the victory. 
Benny Eidbar in the dugout. The difference in this game right now, the difference in this game has been Dan Wheeler's performance out of the Houston bullpen. Yeah. Dan Wheeler has done what the Mets so far have not been able to get. And Mr. Kuh throws one pitch. The lead is gone, and Roberto Hernandez will now be coming in. And Houston has come back with a run in the seventh, two in the eighth to take the lead. Tonight on MSG Network at 10 o'clock, a full recap of opening day here at Shea. Rings in Boston. The Yankees are there too, and the Nets in their final playoff push. All tonight on Sports Desk, presented by Toyota. 10 o'clock on MSG. A 40 year old Roberto Hernandez takes over. Nobody out still in the inning. A double, a triple, and a double have scored two runs to give Houston the lead. And Hernandez, at least off his first. Two outings is showing he's still got some life in that arm. An arm that's recorded over 300 saves in the big leagues. He's going to face Brad Osmus. And where the Mets are now is staring at at least a one run deficit and knowing that Houston has a lights out closer in Brad Lidge. An inning away from being in the game. How many straight have they won where Lidge has gone in a ball game? I want to tell you, you just watched the playoffs last year. And the only thing that kept Lidge from being as Springer looks like he's going to pitch the bottom of the eighth. The only thing that kept Lidge from being a household name in the playoffs last year was Beltra. Yeah. All right, now Hernandez has to shut him down. Don't let, a, don't let yes. another run cross the plate. Give the Mets a chance to come back at the bottom of the eighth. Osmus bunts foul. Hernandez going right after him. Now he wants to talk to Castro. Good friend, I think the point we, the pitching change interrupted. We just need to finish the one point about right field in the inning for the Mets. The one with Cameron DL, the Mets roster is such that they don't have a lot of spare outfield plays. Eric Valent would be the player that would probably be looked at to go in for defense, but you'd lose his possible pitch hitting bat. Marlon Anderson is the other guy who has played some outfield. It was not as if Willie Randolph was presented with an obvious option. It's going to get back beyond Castro's reach. Sometimes the most difficult ball to react to when you're catching is the bunt, the ball that's bunted up in the air rather than the ball that they swing at that goes up in the air. Was a real quick reaction by Castro on that ball. I don't know if he could get to it. It would be tough. Two strikes now to Osmus. Mets infield relaxes. Swing and a foul back. Tavares will be next. Houston started out four and one. They they just swept Cincinnati after the Reds had done the same to the Mets. Houston has beaten Cincinnati in their home ballpark 12 straight. Hernandez gets strike three looking. That's what the Mets need right there. Hernandez to shut him down. Well, that was big to keep. This Kaino from advancing with one man out. Especially on that bunt. Osmus unable to get the ball down to the ground. It's a nasty pitch right there. Outside pitch. We yeah. haven't seen many, many, if any, of those called today. When you're struggling with the bat, that's where they make the pitch. Unhittable. Tavares today struck out twice and then robbed of a hit on a sparkling play by Reyes. Palmero is next. This Cayeno's pinch hit double brought in the lead run. Ooh. Shot to third, two down. This Cayeno with third base uncovered was able to round the bag, but wasn't going anywhere. Castro was standing right at home plate. 
You see if this guy Ano going around third base because David Wright fielded that, that ball was way off the base, but this guy Ano did retreat to third base. He knew he could do that. There was yeah. nobody, nobody there. But the big thing was that the Mets had somebody at home. So Palmero hits with two down. He tripled over the first base bat in the seventh inning. Scored on a hit by Adam Everett. That got used to back within a run. Mm. Everett will be next. It's an interesting, it's something you just don't see. Palmero's up about an inch off the knob of the bat for him. Well, just don't see that anymore. One of the greatest hitters who ever played the game jumps up. One of the greatest power hitters who ever played the game jumps up, Barry Bonds. There's this guy, you know, on third base. This is a precious situation for Castro and Hernandez. Castro has to keep the ball in front of him. But if Hernandez wants to pitch downstairs, you got to go with it. You got to be ready to block it. You never want to go away from a pitcher's strong suit because there's a runner on third base. That pitcher has to have confidence in his catcher. Well, it's getting tough right now. You can see the shadow of the rim of Shea right across the whole plate. And I think you start to see some defensive swings. Unfortunately for the Mets, they weren't the yeah. first three hitters of this inning. Yeah, right now it's not as destructive to your vision as it could be as the shadows move out. That was a pretty good swing. Oh. And Mankiewicz saves a run. Oh. Wow. Palmero again trying to stroke one down the line, and Mankiewicz goes up. That's why he's a gold lover. Nice play, Mankiewicz. Two for Houston, and they have the lead. Now, Doug Mankiewicz has flashed a little bit of his gold glove twice today, and now the Mets will need him to hit as he faces veteran right-hander Russ Springer. Houston's used uh, a couple of different pitchers to set up Brad Lidge. They don't have one set pitcher in that spot. Springer will face Mitkevich, then Diaz, and a pinch hitter. Mitkevich with a base hit in the second, a ground out in the fourth, sacrifice bunt in the sixth. Well, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, Ted, Lidge, you don't want to well, bring him in the game, so pick up two this here. Is, this, is, this is your inning. But you've got to do it quickly. Maybe a base hit and a long ball. Marlon Anderson getting ready. Mankiewicz to right field, driving Lane back, but he's got room and will put it away on the edge of the track. So Mankiewicz out, one away, and here's Diaz. So Diaz with a Kind of a knuckling fly ball to right field in the sixth inning that fell in front of Jason Lane. Allowed Jim, what, the first run to score. It looked like Jason Lane's first move was a little bit back, and then he had come in and the ball dropped in front of him. Diaz muscled the ball out there. It became a very big hit for the Mets. Victor Diaz is not an outfielder by trade. He was a second baseman in the Dodgers organization. And the Mets acquired him. Trey to send Jeremy Bernitz to the Dodgers in 03. You don't picture, decided to put him in the outfield. You don't picture that build right nope. there as a second base. Right. I think the Mets agreed. <laughs> and that's why they tried to find a place for that bat and changing Victor to an outfield. 3 0. This guy's a hitter. He's a minor league hitting champion. That's why if he works with his works on his fielding, as you look at John Franco in the pen, Victor Diaz works on his fielding, he can become
become a pretty good all-around player because he can swing that bat. Double barrel action in that bullpen. Up high, Springer walks Diaz. And the channel starting to move out, as you mentioned, Ted. Marlon Anderson will be the batter. Phil Gardner looking on. How about this two ball clubs today being managed by former second baseman? And here's a former second baseman. I'll tell you what, this is in the first week has looked like a pretty good pickup by the Mets. Marlon Anderson, who was a valuable pinch hitter and utility player for the Cardinals last season, National League Championship team. The Mets picked him up. Anderson is three for five already, two for four as a pinch hitter. Yeah, he's, he's coming off that bench swinging. This is where I thought that Houston might have Franco ready. See if he can force the Mets to waste a batter. But John is the only left-hander on the Houston team right now in their bullpen. The only lefty reliever they have. Took a whack, two strikes now. Well, it is chasing that ball a little bit out of strike zone, but as a pinch hitter, the good ones will tell you they go to the play. It's funny, as an everyday player, they say be selective. As a pinch hitter, the good pinch hitters tell you go to the plate, the first pitch you see, pick a good rip at it if you can get to it. Don't let anything pass. So you're selective as a everyday player and a overly aggressive as a pinch hitter. Gotta relax his hands up. And to right field for a hit. Diaz will get to third. Throw is gonna be cut. Ooh. And Marlon Anderson found the hole. How his third that? pinch hit in the first week of the season. This pinch hit is not that easy, but Marlon Anderson mentioned his hands, how relaxed they are. Look at the player. Hands go back. Bang. He's aggressive as a pinch hitter. That's why so far he's successful as a pinch hitter. See Victor Diaz getting out of the way of the ball, and then he busted from first to third. So the Mets have runners on the corners. Phil Gardner going out. Double barrel action now in that bullpen. Chad Qualls, right-hander, has joined Franco. How strange must it be for John Franco to be warming up in that bullpen? I mean, he did it a yep. long time ago when Cincinnati. he was in Cincinnati, but it's been 15 years. What a career he's had as you look at the pockets on the mound. Jose Reyes will be the batter. Now, Jose Reyes, right now they're saying he's very aggressive. Find out if he'll chase a bad ball. Phil Garner doesn't want to make a habit of something he did regularly in October last year, and that was bring Brad Lidge in. He brought Brad Lidge in the seventh inning a couple times in the postseason. Well, I'd bring well, him in. I'd bring him in and then rest him tomorrow. Yeah, well, he is resting tomorrow. But that's, you can understand over the, to play 162 games like that's pretty tough. So it'll be Springer to race. Innsberg way in on the grass. Just feeding Jose. Breaking off ball, speed. breaking ball, breaking ball. And they're going off speed with him because they feel he's overly aggressive. And he chases this bad ball. I'll tell you what, that auspice is important to this pitching staff. You see him get down there and block That's that exactly ball? Exactly right. He blocks that ball the way you're supposed to. As far as rounding out the shoulders and smothering the ball using your chest protector. Until Jose lays off that pitch, it looks like Houston's going to keep throwing it to him. He's yep. making sliders and curveballs down. Ooh, fastball. fastball up and in. Yeah, and they, you know, they set him up. They threw him the off speed pitch. They've been giving him a steady diet of off speed pitches and a fastball by him upstairs. Well, here's the situation where the leadoff hitter. He's not a leadoff hitter here. He's a hitter that needs to produce a run. He's jumping with his body. When you do that, the bat is behind you instead of out in front. Go back to the mound. Get they him. get one, and they throw it wildly. A big mistake and judgment by Springer in the time yes. run scores. He never should have thrown that ball to second base. You can't get, you can't get Reyes. You can't, you're almost impossible to double him up. How about that? Right back to the pitcher. It should be a surefire double play, but now with Jose Reyes running, he can fly. Springer goes to second. But once he does that, Diaz is yeah. coming home now. Yeah. 
But he went for the double play. He felt they could turn a double play. It would have been He's a 1-6-3 him. double play. You don't get him. But he had Diaz trapped. You know, if Springer had looked at third, they had Diaz trapped off third in a run down. The other thing, Ted, the slide by Marlon Anderson. That's a good slide. And it was, it got in the way of effort turning a double play. Good hard slide by Anderson. That is Reyes' run. There he goes. First pitch. No throw. Who said speed wasn't that important? Stolen base wasn't that important. Well, Reyes steals second base. Take a look as Osmus wisely holds on the ball. Sign of a smart catcher because you don't get him an end pitch. You see the steps? You get about seven steps. You get Reyes four steps and you're not going to get him. Good a running, good base running by Jose Reyes. Kaz Matsui can turn booze to cheers yes. right here. Yeah, the fans have been on Kaz Matsui. He came to New York last year, replaced a very popular player at shortstop, and he struggled. He's making a transition to second base, but he can get the fans in the side with a blow right now. Yes, although he did have him cheering in the sixth with his drag bunt hit. He might do that again. He scored a run. Base hit center field. Uh -oh. Ray is coming uh -oh. home. There could be a play. No, the throw's uh -oh. way offline. And the Mets take the lead. How about that? That throws offline because of Reyes' speed. Joe Gardner looking at he knows. Reyes did it with his legs. He stayed out of a double play. He stole second, scores on a base hit up the bat of Kazmat Sui. Anybody else on outfielders relax, throws the ball to the plate. He rushes the throw, overthrows, it's offline. Matsui hitting the hanging breaking ball. And look at this, this is shallow center field. But because of Reyes' throw is way offline, Matsui's speed brings him to second base. They're going to walk Beltran. And they're going to pitch to Castro. Watch Reyes run. He can fly. Well, that was a hang. Breaking ball, but Tavares was Tavares was almost a deep second base when he uh, threw that ball. Ted, how exciting! Look at Matsui. I don't blame him for clapping his hands. How exciting is that? Reyes stays out of a double play, steals second, scores on a base hit. Matsui hitting the hanger. Not a walking bell trying to get to Castro. Well, now the story of this game, with the Mets having regained the lead. And sure, the Mets would like to add to it here, but the story of this game is now in the Mets' bullpen. Brayden Looper, who hurt booze when he was introduced before the game today, is going to come in to try to save it in his first save opportunity since opening day, and he will have to face Biggio and Bagley. So Brayden Looper getting loose. He'd like to turn it. He will. He'll have an opportunity to turn those booze into cheers. The first at bat for Ramon Castro. At two hits and four at bats yesterday, starting the game catching Pedro in Atlanta. This game is right now an exact continuation of what the first week of the major league season has been look at the scoring in the seventh and eighth innings against the relievers mm -hmm. of both sides Fred Looper would like to stop that one and two now to Castro well, so far, the Mets were able, are able to keep Lidge in the bullpen. It'll be Everett, Biggio, and Bagwell, the top of the Houston order in the ninth inning. He did it with his legs right there. Jose Reyes, what an exciting young player. The Mets are going to have him for many years. into the right field sky it goes and it is a goal oh. the ball drops one scores and held at third is Beltron 
as Biggio and Lane collide and the Mets get a gift insurance run. So the King runs into the veteran, knocks the ball loose. Phil Gardner is a second baseman, you know what he's thinking? Outfielder's ball, once he calls for it, the veteran called for it also. Castro pops it up. Should be an out. Biggio calling for it. Now they're fighting the sun, and Lane, it's in his glove. And with the contact with Biggio, the ball pops out of the glove. You can see it hit the heel of the glove, and a huge, huge break for the Mets on their home opener as Matsui scores. Well, you can imagine watching that replay of Biggio is that he never heard Lane call it, yeah. if Lane even did call it. Biggio certainly never heard it. Well, John Franco is coming in from the Houston bullpen. The Mets lead by two. In pregame introductions, John Franco received a very nice ovation at Shea Stadium. Now let's hear his reception a moment ago. John Franco, well remembered by New York fans. So now he'll take on, as you see his numbers, he'll take on Cliff Floyd, who, as I mentioned earlier, is off to a good start, hanging in tough against left-handed pitching. So we'll see if he can take advantage of John Franco. Mets just caught a break, something they needed after the last week. John Franco has faced four batters so far this season for Houston, all left-handed batters. He's faced Sean Casey twice, given up hits to him. He faced Ken Griffey twice and got him out. So that's where John's role is right now. He's the, I mentioned the one left-hander in their bullpen. The pop-up by Castro that was dropped by Houston was scored an error on the right field. No run that it in, obviously. Got that in. Yep, that's a swing. Well, if the Mets look for a breaking ball from John Franco, they get a problem. Yeah. He never throws one. As he throws that fastball inside to Cliff Floyd. Got it in, though. Absolutely a swing by Floyd. So it's two strikes. John Franco's. Going to continue, will always be a New Yorker, will now make his home in Manhattan with his family. His longtime friend is also here today, Matt Galanti, former Mets coach, Staten Islander. Matt's back working with Houston. Ooh, it's low, and Castro will take second base unchallenged. The base in here, give the Mets and Bra Braden Looper some big breathing room. 1,091st game of John Franco's major league career. For a kid that they said wouldn't make it that bad. To the middle, Floyd delivers. One scores. Here comes Castro. He scores. How about Cliff Floyd? Another hit off a left-hander. John Franco challenged him, and Floyd popped it up the middle and drove in two. Could be one of those years where Cliff Floyd dominates left-handed pitching right there. A huge base hit. Now the Mets lead by four. And here comes Phil Gardner. Phil Gardner is apparently going to make another double switch. With the right-handed batting, David Wright at the plate. Now the question is, as you see Rick Peterson on the phone to the bullpen, will something change down there? It's no longer a safe situation, but I, I would think Bring him very in. important for Brayden Looper Bring to him in. get in there and have a nice, calm inning. Chad Qualls is coming in from the Houston bullpen. Making another double switch in left field. Back in a moment. Well, John Franco got ahead of Cliff Floyd 0-2, but could not put him away as 
Cliff Floyd continues his strong first week against lefties. Chad Qualls comes in from the Houston bullpen as their fifth pitcher. Luke Scott has gone in to play left field in a double switch. This could be one of those years where Cliff Floyd stays healthy and really lives up to the great billing he had as a young player of Montreal. As you look at David Wright. Well, what a lift that'll be for the ball for the Mets ball club if Floyd does that. Right, is the ninth batter in the inning for the Mets. The first batter was Minkiewicz, who flied out. But then Diaz drew a walk. Marlon Anderson pinch hit single to right. And this entire inning swung when Reyes hit a comebacker to the pitcher Russ Springer. With Diaz a third. Diaz looked to me to be completely trapped out, would have been caught in a rundown, but Springer never looked at third. He fired to second. In the hopes, I assume, of starting a double play. Problem is, Reyes was the runner. Yeah. To first base, and no chance to double him up. Tying was, run score. That was a huge play. One ball, two strikes now to David Wright. Matsui put the Mets in front with a hit. And a dropped pop up that should have ended the inning. Scored the third run. And Floyd singled off Franco to bring in two more. Should be the third out. <laughs> Jason Lane puts it away, but the Mets with a five run bottom of the eighth. Three outs left to win the home opener. Braden Looper on to pitch for the Mets. And it's a week after his opening day loss in Cincinnati. That's something that was remembered and he was introduced before the game. Number 40, pitcher Braden Looper. Well, it gets part of New York. You can turn but, that around today. But it's not, yeah, but it's not fun. No player would ever no. want to endure your home opener hearing that. No save opportunity for Looper. He hasn't had one since opening day. He yep. did get one inning of uh, in a game the Mets were losing in Atlanta the other night. Well, but right now, Willie Randolph wants to close this baby out. He's got yep. his closer. He wants it one, two, three. We talked about it the other day. I think that in Major League Baseball, it's going to have to start changing for all closes. When a closer comes in, he looks like he doesn't have it. You got to get somebody up. Usually it's here's the ball. You win it or you lose it. Well, that's a very delicate line to walk because this position, as we mentioned, is there's nothing like it. Well, it's, Ooh, it's communication it's between the manager the and, the, and the pitching staff, but you just can't give a guy a ball and say we're going to win and lose with you. Look at that. I'll tell you what, that's a pretty good pitch right there. No, that, that pitch has been a strike much of today. He even was in, not there. Even in more. 2-2 two, two now to Everett. Boy, Castro sitting right on the inside part of the plate, so that's telling you that they want Everett to hit something inside. He's that, gone the other way in this right. game. But a manager who would operate the way you are suggesting, Fran, a manager would have to have an extraordinary relationship with his closer because the minute that closer yes. knows that that's the case, you risk losing him. No, you talk to him. Reyes guns it. Well, that gun gets the out. Well, Jose Reyes did it with his legs in his ball game. He's always going to do it with his gun. And he made an unbelievable play early in the game, barehanded it. But right there, he gets it in the glove. Why use the glove when you're so good barehanding the ball? He made an unbelievable play early in his ball game. Ball took a bad hop, and he caught it with his bare hand. You know what I think? Just me. I think Reyes is happy. I like watching these kids. These kids love what they're doing. But I don't think Reyes was happy last year. Oh, no. He said the right race. things. Yeah. He smiled. He, but I don't think he was happy. And I think that had a lot to do with what went on and this year. He's happy. He's playing where he knows he should be. Yeah. And you know, in watching these two kids on the left side of the infield, you know that this is, they're having fun playing this game. That's a nasty pitch to Craig Biggio. One and two to Luke, or to Biggio, rather. Well, it's been some day. We've had lead changes galore. 
strike out at Biggio, two down. We've oh, had several reversals in the last innings. We had a 13-minute delay with a malfunctioning batter's eye. And after all of it, the Mets are an out away from a victory. And here's that last pitch. It gets Biggio, and it's a... And there's going to be a reversal here if Braden Looper gets Jeff Bagwell. The reversal will be booze to cheers. And it's lost a little bit now with all of the action of the late innings, but maybe the biggest at bat of this game still was Bagwell being called out on strikes with the bases loaded Ooh. in the fifth inning. That was a nasty pitch. It was inside off the plate. At a time when Houston could have broken the game open. Two and zero to Bagwell. Looper in with a strike. Great Looper experienced in Cincinnati last week was so rare. He only gave up five home runs all last year. Through an extraordinary number of ground balls. It's a ground ball here. Right backs up. And the Mets have won the home opener with a five run last of the eight. And cheers for Looper. Well, he ran our set. I'm used to it. We won one in Atlanta. And we win this ball game here in New York. The home opener in front of a sellout crowd. The place was rocking. And Brayden Looper closed the door for Willie Randolph. And a lot of the fans here were here because of Willie. As he said before the game, he didn't want to think about how many tickets he had bought for today's game. Uh -huh. Saw his wife Gretchen at the ballpark today. And Willie Randolph's got to be happy about these young players. Jose Reyes doing it with his legs. And David Wright swinging a hot bat. Brayden Looper closing the door. Ramon Castro going in, relieving Mike Piazza. But well, Willie Randolph has to be very excited about winning the game in front of his family, friends. His parents were here at the game. Matt Lachlan interviewed his parents. He mentioned his wife, Gretchen. So a big day for Willie Randolph, who grew up in Brooklyn, and his favorite team was the New York Mets. Well, the Mets had the lead. There's the family. That's Willie Randolph's mom. And Willie Sr. There's Willie Sr. and many who Matt spoke with earlier in the game and mentioned a lot of family and friends of Willie Randolph. The Mets smile. A five run eight gives them the home opener, eight to four, back with more on MSG. Wow, not the kind of game you can easily recap in 15 seconds, is it? But the Mets will take it as they score five in the bottom of the eighth after giving up the lead in the top half of the inning. And they prevail in the home opener by a score of eight to four. Yeah, exciting our, ball game. All right, here's our Exxon Mobil game changing play. New high endurance oils from Mobile. The oil that's changing well. And it was this bottom of the eighth when the Mets pieced the rally together, Fran. And you saw Marlon Anderson picking up a base hit. Victor Diaz on first base going all the way to third. So. The Mets had runners on first and third ground ball, and it's thrown to second base. Reyes beats the throw to first, and that there turns the tide in favor of the Mets as Victor Diaz scores the run. Right, that scored the tying run. Mets went on to get four more to win it, but a key was the pinch hit of Marlon Anderson, and he's downstairs with Matty. Matt. All right, Ted, thanks very much. And indeed, pinch hitting uh, has gone very well for Marlon Anderson here in the early going. And Marlon, congratulations on helping the Mets to victory here on the home opener. Talk about your approach uh, here in the eighth inning as uh, you help the Mets get off to that uh, five-run inning. Well, uh, I'm just trying to get out there and do anything I can to help the team win in the situation. You know, right there, Victor was on first base. The hole's open on first base. Everybody knows I pull the ball a lot, but uh, I was just trying to, you know, whatever that, uh, my role was that time. I was, you know, first pitch cutter, you know, next pitch, I swung the ball over my head. But, you know, you still have that one big one left, and today I was fortunate enough to be able to get that hit. Do you have much of a history against Springer? Uh, and if you do, or even if you don't, uh, you know, how do you approach it? Truthfully, I don't know. You know, we, we have reports, we read, and we know what they do. You know, we, we see a little video on them beforehand. But basically, basically, uh, once you get in the batter's box, it's you against him. You know, he's just trying to help your team. He's trying to get you out and help his team. And, you know, today, best man won, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, you came through with the base hit, and the Mets rally was on. Fran Healy, our colleague up in the booth, has often said it's the most difficult thing to do in baseball, and that's to be a pinch hitter. Yet, you've had a good deal of success at it. What's the secret? 
I just try to take every at bat differently. You know, every situation is different. You know, whatever whatever it takes that situation to try to help your team to you know have a chance to score a run, or have a chance to win, or have a chance just to stay in a ball game. You know, you got to do what you can, and every different uh, every situation is different. I think that's what makes it tough because you have to think so many different things on so many different nights. But you know, it's been working so far, and hopefully, I can continue doing it well. But you're also a hitter, and a guy comes to the plate and who's a hitter, he can swing the bat. I'm known for my hitting, you know, so hey, I'm just trying to keep doing that. Marlon, congratulations. Thank you. Marlon Anderson joining us down on the field as the sellout crowd goes away in a happy mood. 8-4 the final score as the Mets win the home opener. They've won two straight now and uh, things looking a little better than they were this time a week ago.